Good morning and thank you for joining us. I am Alero Idu and this is Sunrise. Am I Amakide? Good morning. Welcome. It's the... Uh, wait. It's the first episode of the program. No, no, no. We had a program on New Year's. Uh, oh, it Some... is the first program. You're right. <sighs> My bad. <laughs> happy New Year to you all. <laughs> so happy New Year and welcome to Sunrise. First this year. Well, for those of you who know, of course, it's election year, so it's something you need to pay attention to. Have you got your PVC, by the way? Because Yes, I was going to start by asking you that <laughs> question. Now you beat me to it. Well, yesterday I drove to where I was supposed to uh, collect my PVC. Mm. From like 500 meters, cars lined the road. Oh, dear. When I, and I told my wife, because we went together, I told her, look, if I see a crowd... I'm not staying. I'm just going to... Turn around and go back. I'm just going to drive right across and go. So when I got there... What they call it in acting, what happens? <laughs> I saw a huge <laughs> crowd, and I said to myself, not today. And it's, I think it's uh, understandable because everyone wants to get their PVCs. Of course, of course. And I intend have... to go tomorrow. Tomorrow is Sunday. I think perhaps it's how early you go that matters. Perhaps, yeah. I don't know. Perhaps how mm. early is, you go is what matters because, of course, once I'm done on air at about, say, 9. They I say they're there from to... about 6 a.m. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. I got there about, uh, say, 10? No, oh, that's mid-morning when everybody else is <laughs> well, there. Well, hey, I, I had to I had a breakfast show to, <laughs> to host, so <laughs> well, I, I, just, I just drove past. And okay. Just, well, I, said, I, I wanted to tell whoever, guys, this thing is not working. It's not working. You know, but I also understand that there is this phase where they take the PVCs to the individual wards of many Nigerians, so um, it might be a good idea for you to go to your ward, Find mm. out if your your you can collect your PVCs at your ward now because I believe very, that very that important. was announced yesterday on yes. the news that okay. they be moved to the wards. So from so you don't wards. know your ward, how do you find out which is your ward? Go to voter.inecnigeria.org <laughs> and put in some of the uh, information that you'll be asked there. I think it's... Voters, what? Voter. Voter.inecnigeria. Is it voter or voters? I don't know. Dot .inecnigeria .org. Dot .org. You should be able to tell you. .org. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, it's voter. Voter.inecnigeria.org. Okay, voter. Yeah. You'll be able to um, uh, put in some basic information, like maybe your name or mm -hmm. your... Or your... On the number. Number. On your mm -hmm. screen. Mm -hmm. on, on your... Uh, on the slip yeah. that was given to you, mm -hmm. and then you'll be able to use that to say, okay, this is my ward. My this ward. is where I can... This is where, okay. you know... But I will start from the local head. government tomorrow and see what happens. Mm. Well, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> <laughs> but that, that's really important. Everyone needs to get their PVCs, because I, saw, I came across a very uninteresting data uh, for the 2019 elections. According to INEC, of course, we had a little over 83 million voters registered. registered. Mm. But just about 28 million of us voted in the 2023 elections. And 2019. In the 20, let's beg your pardon, 2019 elections. Mm. Just about 28 million of us voted. Now we have almost 100 million voters. How many of us are going to vote? Well, I, we, I we suspect also, there's going to be a difference because hopefully. many Nigerians want to vote. Because we time. also understand that there are about 6.7 million voter cards uncollected. So They'll be collected before the 23rd of January? The song by Bongo Secret comes to mind. Amen. <laughs> 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 Now, this uh, cashless business is generating a lot of um, conversation, you know. You mean interests? Well, people have to be interested mm -hmm. because uh, this thing has been on now for the past 10 to 12 years. And is it gathering traction? Are people embracing it more than they did five years ago? 
in some areas, some people do like they haven't even heard about it. But my issue this morning is, um, if you are someone who commutes to work every day via Okada or Kekenapep, are you going to be asking them for the bank details so you can transfer the 100 Naira for your transport fare to their accounts? Oh, I don't know. I, I don't work with the CBN yet, just in case. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't remember that, that conversation we had with the CBN director of bank uh -huh. operations that came. One of the things that he said was that it's not just the POSCs and um, ATMs. So they have uh, this bank agents, POS merchants or whatever it is. I don't remember what they call mm. them. You know, that in the hinterlands, they're there in yes. millions, yes. all of that. So yes. that's there. But there's another one that I don't think as a nation we haven't ex even explored. And that's the one you can pay with your phone. I, think, I don't know, I don't even know what to, to call it, but there is that mobile whatever. It's part of that circular that the CBN, you know, released. The thing, the question you asked is very, very salient, which is how deeply or widespread have the information or education of Nigerians gone mm -hmm. about the cashless policy? I don't hear too much about it on radio, and I think radio is the medium. And radio is the medium. Mm -hmm. Look, take it or leave it. I mean, it's a good thing that you can see us, and you can hear us and everything, but radio is still that default that the mega, the, uh, yeah. my, the, the radio is the only one that people will put out. I remember growing up in, uh, on, the, on Lagos Island, Almost adjacent, well, adjacent to our, the frontage of my house at the time where I lived with my parents, there was this radio box, this speaker that was there. It is called Rediffusion. <laughs> that, radio, <laughs> that, that speaker was out there. You will hear go, 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 Whatever it is saying, I had no idea. Bolu bado baku tani yo joye. So ni gbesi ni bi lo si lekeji. All kinds of things. All kinds of things were said about it. So that information, that education, not just information, the education needs to go out. I keep referring to the Mamsa days where whatever government was going to be, was going to do, government was... Adept that it. it was going to be done. Yeah. Not doing is, is out of the question. It is the process, the how, the why that government will listen to people for mm. and make necessary adjustments mm. to ensure that the thing lines up with mm. what the people can live with. Mm. I'm not hearing much about that. Uh, when the 20 Naira note, I keep going back to the past because yeah. we've done these things well before. Yeah. Yeah. I, when the 20 Naira note, the highest denomination at the time, was going to be released. It was noised for months. Months. Not just, it was for months. But there's no doubt about it. You can't compare the NOI to MAMSA. MAMSA. Even this Naira note thing came be well mm. before MAMSA. Mm -mm. The 20 Naira note thing came well, maybe because we only had radio uh, NTA and uh, radio Nigeria. Radio Nigeria. At the time. Yes. But yes. It, was, it was, you just, you couldn't miss it. And the cashless thing is not the only thing we need to be educated about. We also need to be educated about this new Naira, this, this new redesigned. I'm sure you have all seen videos of people rejecting them, saying, give me the old one. I mean, the old one will, be, will not be legal tender as at the end of this month. So what's going to happen? Well, people uh, don't seem to have heard about it. I... I, I, I... There's a lot of work for the authorities about this thing. I know that the Central Bank of Nigeria has an information department or whatever it is, publicity or pub, whatever, the way they public talk affairs. to Nigerians, public mm. affairs department, that they talk to Nigerians. I'm not hearing much about that. And I think that word needs to go out and not just go out to inform, but to educate. For instance, what are the features? The, uh, you, you, you know, talked about the fact that people are rejecting it. It is because people are not even aware. I'm sure you saw that video as well of someone's clothes being torn simply because he paid in the new Naira note. Had the, the, the woman literally 
tore this fellow into shreds. Maybe it was acting, maybe it was this big thing, but it was on the front page that someone, Okada man in Ibadan, refused to collect the new Naira note, saying it was fake. It was on the front page of the dailies. Oh, dear. And not just some online paper. It was one of the conventional newspaper houses that put it on the front page that we reviewed in Oyo State, Ibadan. Capital city of Oyo State. Oh, it's dear. not too far from here. Oh dear. Maybe I could walk about five days to get B there. Big town, not uh, rural area. So it's rural not just area. some Adoawaye or some uh, Kafanchan or anyway. Waye. It's Ibadan. <laughs> so the, the thing we are talking about here is edu the education needs to go out. Mm. Let people know that number one, because how many Nigerians speak English? So let this info, let the communication go out. Don't reject the Naira. I God. Before the network news of the 90s, you, you knew the name Andrew. You knew the name Andrew. Andrew, no check out, though. It even became a song. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> the education needs to go out about that one. That's number one. Number two, the security, so-called security features. Yes, the NSP. We need to know all about those so yeah. the people will readily accept them. The NSPNC, because... uh, you know, of course, the CBN was very proud and uh, through the for the president to say, look, we're proud to say we made this in Nigeria. We doff our hearts. However, um, someone sent me a picture, uh, was it two, a week or two oh. ago, of uh, an, a Naira note that was washed. And in fact, people make notes and say, look, this thing is, the, the colors are fading. Someone also made a video and, say, and said, even the dollar has, a, the colors usually come up sometimes, yes, but not to the point of completely fading. Is it? Well, we also um, heard the. Um, who are they now? The Nigeria Security Printing and Minting Company. Uh -huh. Explain that the special inks used in producing the new Naira notes, which leave traces when rubbed on plain white surfaces. So they have admitted that they leave traces. Mm -hmm. That is a uh, umbu. <laughs> <laughs> And they are generally a security feature of all banknotes that makes them easily distinguishable from counterfeited notes. Pause. Pause. So if I forget mm. any of these new Naira notes... In your white... In my white... Shokuto. Or shirt pocket. Yes. The one that I wear for sunrise. That is it. And it washes. Or bleach, yeah. I'll see, see red or green or, or blue. Or blue. blue. Or bleach it. Noted. You will bleach it because they themselves have admitted. But the thing is that they say that it is generally a security feature of all bank notes. But we didn't notice that in all our old notes. I'm, I'm lost. Well, the polymer notes, of course, now will not wash. Uh, the 29 notes of old, the 59 notes of old, the, I think it was the 10 um, notes of, of old. You say they didn't wash? No, the, the polymer notes. They looked faded. After some time. Oh, well, not on my clothes. <laughs> no, not on your clothes, uh -huh. but, you know, sitting after down. After some time, yes. yes, I mean, that happens. But mm. this one, we need more education. That is, we need more education. That is fading off on your clothes. Well. <clears throat> um, and it shouldn't just be uh, just <laughs> what you put out. We need to be educated about it, not just some news reports. Even ordinary camera, Jingu, you can Jingu, do. You can, yeah. In Yoruba, in Igbo, in Aousa, in Shekiri, in Urobo, in, the, in, in a way that people Bogwe. cannot miss it. Please. And the old note stopped being legal tender in exactly three weeks from today. Well, I'm not going to speak for the CBN, but with this level of... Um, Non-information, non-acceptance more, maybe. Yes? Consider, there are considerations for... Extension? For an extension, I don't know. Because it is also part of the reason, okay, so now we are talking about cashless, you are talking about faded cash at a time when we are talking about multidimensional poverty. <sighs> I, 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 well, please, um, for many people who might be wondering, you know, I mean, you've just seen the headline. You know, one of the most painful things that I saw in that map, Alero, is the, 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 the percentages, okay,
if you if you can, um, I don't know if that that particular QR code is going to come on screen for you. You can scan it and go look at some of the things that are that are uh, coming. Okay, this is this. If you can scan this code right now, pause. If you can scan this code at home right now, wherever you are, you will find some very, very interesting information from the federal government of Nigeria through the National Bureau of Statistics about what this whole thing is about. You'll get some information that will be, will be very, very interesting. Interesting and one. disconcerting. D very, very disconcerting. Oh. Because this is not something that can just be left to corporate social responsibility or personal social responsibility of individuals. Yeah. It is for us to know the severity of what the issues are. For instance, my apologies. Um, we looked at the, when you look at the map, um, the, the details of, that, of, of, the, of, of the information, you find out in the Southeast, they have 10.5 million, uh, no, 10. 10.85 million people in poor, who are poor. South South has 19.66 million poor people. And in the Southwest, there are 16.27 million people poor. But guess what? In the Northwest of Nigeria, there are 45.49 million people poor. What does that say to you? It says more there all of the South, South, Southeast, and Southwest are consumed. The number is consumed by the number of poor people in the Northwest alone. Alone. And if you look above the report, as I said, you can go to that QR code, and I hope you'll be able to get the information. But one of the things that you also hear is that 65% of poor people, that is 86 million, live in the North, while 35%, nearly 47 million, live in the South. We're revisiting this because it's election year. But the, you know, one of the questions that really bother me, Alero, is who is speaking to the issues that people need to address in the North? And who you know, are the people? Whose voices are we hearing? Other than the, pe the, the what should I call it, the, the tokens that mm. the federal government sends to the poor people there through the uh, mini Federal Ministry of uh, Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management. Who is speaking? Who is raising the issues in the north so that we can pull people out of poverty and return the children that are out of school into schools for the sake of their future? And all these stats you just reeled out are in spite of the fact that the president said in 2015 that he was going to raise 100 million people out of poverty. Even if he had said, even if he, had said he was 10 million, he was going to raise out of poverty. How many has he been able to raise out of poverty? It looks like more people are getting living below the poverty line. He said, we can in collaboration with the states. I'm sorry, I'm going to go back to that map. That map says, I mean, if you are able to scan that code, that I, okay, that's it. If you can able to scan this code, you, this is one of the things that you'll find. You'll find a map full of all shades of brown. The brownest of the browns is in Sokoto State. The president's own state. Sokoto, no, 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 that, that, that's Katsina. 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 Yeah. Uh, the, that, the one in the, in the president's state is not as brown. I assure you. I assure you. Now, the population of people in Sokoto State is 6,400,000 people. The population of people who are multidimensionally poor in Sokoto State is 5,810,000. Percentage, 90.5%. 90.5% of hmm. people who are dimensionally poor. Well, all those who are struggling to be governors of states and those who are struggling to be president of Nigeria, hope they are aware of the nature of the work that awaits them. Because we cannot continue to live like this with 90% of the people in a state and living in poverty. And that's just so So what are you doing as the governor of that state? If you go to Bayelsa, the population is 2.9 million. Multidimensionally poor people, 2,610,000. So only 300,000 are okay. 88.5%. So exactly what are we talking about here? 
So if you are vying for office of governor mm. or mm. president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, I do not envy you, but be sure mm. that we will hold you to account. The media has a constitutional responsibility to raise the issues and bring to the fore issues of development that the federal government of Nigeria or any state in the country must do. You don't do it, the media will come after you. Give Here. us the issues. Raise the issues. Let them be interrogated. Here. Here. <clears throat> Now, our menu for today, we have our eyes, or we shall have our eyes, on Nigeria's spending plan. After all, this is a new year. And the budget is already out. Then we're going to have this uh, Oyemeko Grammar School's 70th Founders Day. Well, that's for those of you who came from that school. I wonder how old is my school. My school is old. But anyway, that's for another time. <laughs> And on our lifestyle segment today, we'll be looking at a New Year resolution for stress relief. Do people still do that? Hmm. Don't know about New Year resolutions, but the stress relief part <laughs> I want to hear about. <laughs> because people will put themselves under unnecessary pressure. Because I couldn't meet my target last year. I gotta... Anyway, the artist of the week today is... Uh... A he. Oh, it's a he. Okay. That's a relief. Okay, so you see... Not too much on the list, but most certainly exciting. So please, uh, we're going to take a short break now and uh, come to the, with the issues for the day. Grab your cup of cocoa or cocoa or whatever it is. I'm having this one. See you in a bit. I'd love that slide there. Mm. Just bundles and bundles of cash. Wait, you didn't see the text they wrote beside it? What did it say? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I wish somebody would just gift me a, a heap like that for New Year. Hey, that, there's the picture illustrating what was written beside you. You didn't see what was written beside no. it? No. Oh, God. I'm single minded, I'm focused. <sighs> No wonder you're a woman. <laughs> <laughs> now let's get down to business. <clears throat> the International Monetary Fund believes that 2023 is going to be a difficult year for many countries, mm. Mm. many economies, that is. But the good news is that um, Nigeria is not counted among those countries. The ones that will have it difficult. Mm. They say so. Even Amen. though. We are in debt already, and our debt is now approaching 77 trillion. But, well, those are things that economists are going to explain to us in the course of today's program. And it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ayo Teriba, CEO of Economic Associates. Thank you. Good morning. Thanks for joining us, sir. And we also have joining us virtually Dr. Andrew Nevin, advisory partner and chief economist at PricewaterhouseCoopers. Good morning and thank you for joining us. Well, we can't hear you yet, but uh, we'll get to it. Okay. Doctor, <clears throat> um, the good news says that Nigeria is not among the countries that are going to have a good time in 2020. A difficult time. A diffic well, okay. Yeah, please, please, please. A <laughs> difficult please time in 2023. But the signs that we see as common people are not signs that lead to that kind of answer. Oh, well, um, you have to uh, read and contextualize what the, the IMF is saying very well. Mm -hmm. And so if, they, if, you know, for example, health agencies, one, that's... Uh, m many people will, you know, contract a particular disease next year, and uh, then, you know, give you a list of likely people who have the disease, and you don't find some names there. It might be either because they will never catch the disease, or they have already indeed. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> they are not, there's no warning for them. <laughs> you know, so they are already in it. He that is down, there's <laughs> <Yes, laughs> no warning for them. Oh, dear, 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 dear. dear. But you know, it, 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 is, it, is it really supposed to be comforting? Because uh, hmm. over the years, it would seem like the opinion or economic advisory that is suggested to us as a nation by IMS, IMF or the World Bank or any of these multinationals, since as far back as I'm smart enough to know my left from my right, it will seem like those policies literally guide some of the economic policies or direction that we take as a nation. Is this something for us to worry about or something for us to cheer? Well, it doesn't matter where the source of the advice is. Mm. You can advise yourself, and others can offer you opinion. At the end of the day, you should listen to all views and filter them and choose what's best for you. Um, so anybody can warn, and uh, you too can institute a watch you know, to try and see what risks and dangers are in the horizon, primarily to prepare to deal with them. So being told that the road ahead may be difficult doesn't mean that you won't get past the difficult faces yeah. right. if you prepare adequately for it. So, okay. So it sounds, I, it sounds to me, Mr. Uh, Dr. Nevin, that um, it's perhaps, would you see that's one of those advisories that came from for instance, the World Health Organization, that of what would happen to Africans uh, in the wake of COVID-19, and that didn't happen. Is it something we should take in that light as well, or we should take this a little more seriously? Well, I think I mean I think that's a very good example with the, with the WHO came out and had in 2020 dire predictions about Africa and the impact of COVID, and of course it didn't come true. And one of the reasons it didn't come true is I don't think they really understood the conditions on the ground. I mean, with respect to the World Bank and the IMF advice, I mean, I'm not really sure that it's you know particularly interesting advice. I mean, all of the technical issues, we have lots of very talented Nigerian uh, economists, including Dr. Taraba, who's here with us today, and many others. They know what to do technically. So I'm not sure the advice, to be honest, is that helpful. I think Dr. Taraba is exactly right. Nigeria needs to find its own uh, economic path. I don't think it's, it's we've written, of course, as PwC, that the path is not like South Korea, it's not like Vietnam, it's not like Bangladesh. All those countries have done very well. Um, but there's a different path for Nigeria based on the unique circumstances on that. So I don't think we should spend a lot of time really listening to the IMF and the World Bank. I mean, it was uh, His Royal Highness Samu, <laughs> Sanusi, uh, His Royal Highness, uh, Mohamed Sanusi II, that when he was CDN governor, told me, said, Andrew, all of the successful countries in East Asia, listen to the IMF and World Bank, pretend that they're going to do what they do and do something different that's right for them. So I think we're in the same, same situation, and Dr. Tarab is exactly right. It's not terribly relevant. I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm happy that you put it that way. We should just chart our own economic path, right? And ignore or maybe not give too much attention to whatever the IMF or the World Bank is saying, but... It sounds like you're saying whatever they're saying is a guide, as Dr. Teriba has said. But let me just ask you, when you say Nigeria needs to create its own economic path, is that saying in any way that there isn't a clear economic path for Nigeria as a nation? Well, I mean, we just put out the paper that just gave a clear path to it. And what we said, I mean, I said a few minutes ago, we, our path is not like South Korea, which climbed up the manufacturing value ladder, or China said, did, it, did the same thing. We, we said, in fact, Nigeria's path should be more like India in the sense that we should be exporting high value added services. That's the best way for us to diversify our export earnings. It's something that we can do in a modular way. It's already happening. So there are a lot of people that come out and say, we need to start in low end manufacturing. We put out a view that said that's not appropriate for Nigeria's conditions. I mean, we already compete on the service end of global value chains. We need to expand that. Companies like Outsource Global and Tech, tech Expert in, the, in uh, Abuja and Lagos respectively have over a thousand seats each growing very rapidly and we can expand that. And India exports $200 billion worth of uh, services. So we think that's the kind of path that Nigeria should follow and not necessarily this low end manufacturing on, on that. That's, so that's the view that we put out, which is very specific for the Nigerian conditions. Dr. Chariba, 
Um, I'm going to phrase this the same way that I phrased my opening question to you, because a lot of Nigerians are a bit worried. When many of us mere mortals saw the budget and we saw a deficit of 12 trillion, how are we going to cope with this? Already we have a debt stock of 77 trillion. Then we 44 have... trillion. It's projected by May next year to reach 77 trillion. Okay. Next year, that is this year. This year? Yes, by May this year. That's correct. <laughs> That's just a few technically months. Technically, four months away. That's right. It will, if they succeed in issuing the law. that much. All this seems very worrying to the mere mortal out there. It's worrying, it all it's to worrying to gloom, everyone. Gloom. It's worrying, you know, for everyone. Uh, but just like Andrew said, it's not, we shouldn't bewail the diagnosis. We should debate ways of solving the problem. Just like you deal with illness. At the end of the day, however severe the illness is, the important thing is to get the patient to recover. So Nigeria needs a conversation about how to stabilize the fiscal situation. It's, it's an understatement to say that you have a fiscal crisis when your well, our last actual revenue is the one we made in 2022, 6.5 trillion as of the end of November. So if you add another half a trillion for December, however you do it, you are not going to get much more than 7 trillion, 7.5 trillion. That's our revenue capacity. Mm. We are proposing to issue debt of nearly 12 trillion. Unfortunately, out of that 7 trillion revenue, uh, we laid out 6 trillion on interest payment. So net revenue for us after paying interest was 1 trillion. In the end, we borrowed 7 trillion so we could spend 8 trillion. The current capital, everything. So last year we spent 8 trillion. Although total spending was about 14 trillion. Six trillion of it was just interest payment. So, and we are headed for the same scenario unless something is done differently. That's where we are headed. Well, um, our, in the our, new year. our oil, uh, crude oil production is rising gradually. Isn't that of any help? Yeah, well, uh, it's not of great help because uh, the yeah. bulk of revenue projected for 2023, 80% of it is still going to come from non oil. So what's coming from oil is put at 20% by the um, fiscal authorities. And, and so what could we have done differently? Is it inevitable that Nigeria should have a debt stock of 77 trillion? Or should what is going to be added from last year to you know, this year, 33 trillion? Should Nigeria, you know, be in a situation where, and that's the question, that maybe that's the debate that, we'll, that we should have engaged in maybe eight years ago at the beginning of the current regime. So let me ask you that question. Yes. Should Nigeria be having that kind of debt stock? At a time when the Federal Ministry of uh, Finance, Budget, and National Planning is saying we don't have a debt problem, we have a revenue problem. We have both the revenue problem and the debt problem, in that the trend of revenue in the past eight years have been decidedly downward, however you look at it. You may be under some illusion if you are looking at the Naira revenue, but once you convert into dollars or you correct for inflation, revenue has no dive. Steeply, not just for the federal government, for other types of government. So we have a revenue problem. And that itself is globally induced. It's not just Nigeria. It's everyone, given the, what has happened to commodity prices, as we know. Mm. So you need a change of approach from the way you prospered when 
commodity prices were you know, escalating, you are unlikely to prosper if you continue to do things that way. Do, so do, do you it, line up in any way with what uh, Dr. Nevin was, was suggesting, that Nigeria should focus a little more on manufacturing and those uh, uh, such things, as was done by the Asian countries he sampled? Um, it's not a matter of agreeing or disagreeing. Nigeria should do what Andrew has suggested. But we are discussing the fiscal situation right now. What we're talking about is getting adequate revenue and must we borrow so heavily. So what Nigeria did not do, that if you look at our peers, what they weren't doing then, which they started doing from like 2015, 2016, whether you are looking at Brazil or you are looking at India or you are looking at Saudi Arabia or now Egypt, they recognized the limits on revenue. And rather than jump into the debt market, they switched to an investment funding for their activities. So Nigerian government has issued nothing but debt in eight years as if equity market does not exist, either at home or abroad. So we issue the most expensive bonds at home. We issue the most expensive bonds abroad. We never issue equity. And if you look at the strong developing countries, it doesn't matter what you want to fund. You may want to fund infrastructure. You may want to fund manufacturing. You may want to fund health or education. They are looking more at getting investment, getting equity to fund government. Not about private companies attracting equity into private operations. But sovereigns, open, opening portals. Like the Nigeria, in Brazil has the partnership for private investment. It was introduced within the last seven years. India has the India investment grid. It was introduced in the last seven years. And the Saudi didn't even have a national privatization agency, but they've created one now. And they're creating a portal that looks like that of Brazil and that of and Egypt is joining. Is that are we together? Oh, so what are we, we doing? just want to do either revenue or debt. Mm. It has proved unsustainable. We should be looking at a financing mix that gives more weight to equity mm. than debt. Nobody is going to scream if you say your stock of FDI is going to be 200 trillion next year. It will be seen as a sign of strength, which is what our peers are boasting about. They are attracting more FDI as sovereigns. But everybody is screaming, your stock of debt will be 7, 7 trillion, and your oh. revenue is just 7 trillion. Oh. Uh, you know, oh it's staggering. It seems such a long way. So you do have end. revenue problem, you have debt problem, you have debt cost problem. Oh hmm. my God. And somehow there are problems they are solvable. They are They're myriad. solvable. We are projecting <laughs> debt rising in, in, in five months. Five months. We could have been asking ourselves what should we do to avoid that scenario. Mm -hmm. There could be things we can do today so that that prophecy will not become self-fulfilling. <laughs> that we, we, we will come back to you to ask you that question, Certainly. but I need to ask uh, Dr. Uh, Nevin this question. You mentioned the other time about us uh, charting our own course, and you mentioned manufacturing. Um, manufacturing was a big thing in Nigeria in the 80s, and it just petered out with many companies packing up and going to other West African countries. What things do you think that we can do to bring back manufacturing? No, I think that's a, a very good question. And, uh, and I think we need to be candid about what, what's happened here. So, I mean, we've had the incredible organization, PEBEC, for the last seven or eight years, head, headed by Dr. Chimoke. So this is to create better conditions for doing business, ease of doing business. 
Um, the way I would characterize it is that the, the government, uh, certainly at the federal level, has said all the right things about trying to create an enabling business environment. But the reality on the ground is it continues to be very harsh uh, for many sectors, for all sectors, including particularly manufacturing. Now, you know, why manufacturing is so harsh? The infrastructure continues to be a problem. The power issue is not being solved in any substantive way. It's difficult to go in and out of the ports, both physically, but also in terms of dealing with Nigerian customs and the multitude of agencies on there. So it's not a very good environment for manufacturing. Um, and until we kind of have an honest and candid conversation about it, I don't think we're going to make much progress. I think we've pretended that we've made progress on the ease of doing business, but we haven't made any real progress. And of course, the manufacturers have then voted with their feet and with their capital, and they've gone to other places in Africa, particularly with AFCFDA on the rise, and they can manufacture elsewhere. So I think unless the federal government, in conjunction with the states, is really uh, committed to, to truly making changes in an enabling business environment, we're going to continue to have manufacturing struggle. But I mean, without power, without infrastructure, without a, a system of ports for both imports and exports for manufacturing, moving physical goods, it's not going to work. It's kind nice. of a difficult, difficult situation for the country. Well, you know, staying on that same issue, um, there are quite a number of things that would seem uh, we perhaps, I mean, going by what uh, you heard Dr. Teriba say, some things that we perhaps have left undone and some things we're doing that we shouldn't be doing. So it will seem like the cart and the horse are, are, are occupying either's place. So looking at it from the perspective that you, you know, said that your organization has looked at it, releasing a paper and all of that, what are the shortfalls? And what are the low-hanging fruits that you see? If that prophecy <laughs> that uh, Dr. Teriba is referencing is not going to come to pass, what are the shortfalls we have had now? And what do you think are the low-hanging fruits that we can catch up with within the next three, four months, so that in the fifth month of this year, we don't have that debt stock of $77 trillion? Yeah, no, it's a very good question. I mean, I think that we're in the camp with many other um, commentators about it, that you know, we have the three big distortions, which are really the low-hanging fruit. And the most obvious distortion is the FOIL subsidy. Again and again and again, any study, any analysis of it shows that the FOIL subsidy benefits the rich or benefits those who, who you know, essentially a corrupt system, whether it's uh, subsidizing FOIL that doesn't exist or subsidizing FOIL that goes to other countries. I mean, it's consuming the nation. I mean, the official number is six point, you know, is over six trillion, but that's done at the official exchange rate. It's actually larger. So we have this extraordinary situation where, between the decline in oil price um, and the foil subsidy, essentially oil is contributing nothing to the to the economy when we only have, uh, you know, one point zero, one point one million barrels a day of production. So that's the number one thing. I mean, we've also consistently been in the camp exchange um, liberalization. And you know, I know all the arguments against it. We understand people want to kind of have exchange, foreign exchange go to the highest value uses. But it's not something that really there's any evidence the government can, can control. It has so many knock-on effects with our current exchange regime, particularly because of this uh, impact of brown tripping on, uh, on that and the corruption that goes with that. And the third one, of course, the electricity tariffs. I mean, very difficult situation with the electricity tariffs. Um, and it needs to be market-determined electricity tariffs. We've advocated for the electricity to actually be a state matter. States can figure out their own electricity needs, the technology they want to use, the structure they want, and they can wield the power in them. So those are the three distortions. Um, but about, beyond that, I think once we get through those three distortions, then a real concerted effort to improve the business environment. And I think one aspect that's really critical is the Orange Shea report. I mean, it was produced in 2013. His Excellency President Buhari has sent it to it in 2020. We still have not seen any tangible results. I was reading this morning about an agency I'd never heard of and their, their, uh, what their activities, which seem to be things that this type of agency should not be doing. But with the complexity that we introduced to the environment here, where we have it, I, I get different numbers for how many federal agencies, MDAs we have, whether it's 700, 1,000, 1,200. But it's just not a system that's going to be workable in terms of creating a conducive environment for economic growth. And to go back to the fiscal situation that, that you were discussing with Dr. Terrell about, 
I mean, our view is being it's not it's not a, a revenue problem. It's really a growth problem. I and mean, we said seven or eight years ago, if we continue to grow at two or three percent, we would eventually have a fiscal crisis. And unfortunately, in all that seven or eight years, we've only grown or in the last sometimes in the one point something percent. We haven't grown enough. And the result is we're now reaching that kind of uh, fiscal crisis. But the only solution, in our view, is faster growth. I mean, we've always said we should have a minimum of six to eight percent. Uh, His Excellency Governor Amafila at the CBN has come out and said we should be growing at double digit. Hmm. And yet we still have um, the projections. The Ministry, the Honorable Minister of Finance, Budget, and National Planning, I think, came out yesterday and said the projection for 2023 in terms of growth is 3.7 percent. I mean, it's better than 2%, but it's still not nearly good enough. And we're going to continue to have a worsening fiscal situation unless we get growth up to 6 to 8%. And you can't, when she said there's a revenue problem, you know, I understand what she's saying, but it's very difficult to take more revenue, more tax revenue out of a system that's not growing. So if it's only growing at 3%, I mean, it's barely keeping up with population. People's incomes are not getting higher per capita, and then you're trying to take more from their wallet. That's very difficult. Whereas if it's going at 6 to 8%, people are getting wealthier, and they'll understand the need to pay more taxes uh, in that situation. Mm. Well, it would seem like, uh, I don't know, uh, Dr. Tereva, uh, you know, there's so much. I mean, you both are raising issues that, I mean, it's a national symposium. <laughs> There are topics and not for national symposium. So I'm just wondering, I mean, he, uh, by the way, Dr. Dr. Neving, that question you raised about the number of MDAs that we have is still bugging me as well. But the place that I will probably go to first is to ask the Auditor General's office which agencies collect money. Maybe that will give us an idea, you know, because there are so many ministries, departments, and agencies that for the life of me, I wonder where, where they are coming from. But to you, you know, Dr. Teriba, one of the things that Dr. Nevin mentioned now is about the role that the states can play in all of this. The federal government can project all they want, but uh, projecting a growth of uh, 3% when we should actually be doing double digits, I've always contended that we are always on the fringes of recession, as far as I am concerned, at least from what I what I see, because when we fall into recession, we go by 1% or 2%. When we come out, we stay out by 1% or 2%. So I, for me, it's almost like we're always working on the touchline of, of, of recession. But what role can the states play, or either collaboratively or you know, as regions, or even in collaboration with the federal government? Ask that question, Dr. Tereba. I guess the background of that information from the National Bureau of Statistics about the level of level of poverty in the states. There are states that have up to 90%, more than 90% multidimensionally poor people. As Dr. Nevin said, how much taxes can come from these people when the federal government is looking at revenues in that regard? None. The OPS is saying already they pay something in the region of 50 different taxes, federal taxes, state taxes, local government taxes, all by one company. So I'm wondering, in the light of that, what kind of collaboration is lacking and should get back on board in order for us to have uh, some measure of economic equilibrium? Right. Uh, both the federal and subnational governments have different roles to play. Uh, there is very little that states can do about macroeconomic outcomes. In the realm of monetary, no, no state has a central bank. I get Nigeria that. Only have, Nigeria only has one, one central bank. bank. Yeah. And Therefore, the business of managing the exchange rate and forex reserves has to be state. pitched at the national the level. level. Yes. The same with the budget. I mean, the lion's share of the, the collective budget of the states is usually typically equal to that of the federal government. Until recent times, when the central, uh, when the federal government could borrow without limits. So for the year 2023, the federal government is proposing to spend 21 trillion. Mm -hmm. 21.83. The states are collectively spending 10 trillion. Okay, so for the first time, the state's collective spending power is just half 
of what the federal government is assuming that the federal government finds the money to fund 20 trillion uh, well and that they don't spend too much of a fraction of that on interest payment mm -hmm. however at the state level you are not talking about issues of macro stability you know you have to encourage the states have to encourage the federal government to create a, a macro stable ma macro climate like this thing of don't issue too much debt explore equity for the collective good of everyone but states are closer to the people in that states deal with four issues one the minor one of the solvency of the state government itself because um, the other three legs of the issues that states deal with, for example, physical capital or human capital or production value chains, all are dependent on the state's remaining solvent. For the state to make sure that bottles are filled, mm -hmm. you could reach your farmland, you know, you could drive through the cities and the rest of it. So, so it starts with how do we ensure that states are solvent? Just as we are saying, that we need to ensure that the federal government is liquid and is stable. Uh, states need to be solvent. And then the federal government can do very little about the physical capital in each state. They can do very little about the human capital in each state. And they can do very little about the value chains situated in each state. You don't find all products in all states. But essentially, we, we it sounds like, my apologies, Dr. Into oil producing, you know, agricultural, commercial. It yes. sounds like you are saying that the federal government has little to do with solving multidimensional poverty problems. This is not about multidimensional poverty problems. You cannot ask state to come and cater for the human capital in Lagos State. I, I, you can't I, ask Lagos to go and cater for physical capital in the, so you can't tell it's not state something, to come and do something it's about not, products that it doesn't have. It's not a responsibility for the federal so, government. So That's what you're that saying. That is closer to the state government. Yeah. The well being of farmers People. in your state mm. to make Farming sure that the road gets from the Pass. city to the farm. Mm. You know, federal government will connect different states, but each state will have to connect the different local governments in this area. Mm. So the attention that we, what uh, the bedrock of poverty is, to fight poverty, you have to give people skills that can earn them income. It's the bottom line of it. And if you sit down as a state, mm. And you watch a uh, large fraction of your workforce uh, be rendered unemployed, either because of technological change or because of any shock. You know, it could be even structural change. The economy is developing, and therefore certain skills that used to earn people income cannot earn them income anymore. For example, this threat of automation. You look at what has happened to drivers collectively. Uh, there used to be a major economic force. You get to any uh, five-star hotel, you find half of the space is for taxis. Mm. You get to the likes of CMS, Marina, you know. Mm. They, where are they now? With the advent of the, the airports, the advent of uh, hey, light, hey, light hey, sharing. <laughs> it has destroyed like and their income hmm. base. Hmm. No drive, you can't claim now that uh, my service is better than yours. <laughs> you know, each driver is a commodity. Hmm. Hmm. You all get the same rate <laughs> from yeah. Uber. So now it's the duty of each state to be awake to the incidence of such developments on their populace. Mm. and to reskill them because as some jobs are being displaced, the demand for oh, new yes. ones oh, are coming. Yes. So we don't mm. pay attention to that in Nigeria. You know, you get a lot from pay, but these things threaten that pay base. Mm. You know, and if you look at this age when youths migrate, you watch 
any of the migrants. It really doesn't matter what it is they do in their destinations. Mm. If you watch them six months after they get there, whatever it is they are doing, they will be upskilling. Yeah. One year, two years, five years, you could say, well, I'm Mekera, I'm not a registered this, mm. <laughs> I'm a mm. security, I have now got this level of certification. We don't pay attention to that. Even when state government or, or federal government do entrepreneurship, you know, programs, uh, training programs, you asked what level of certification? Is this stratified? Mm. Yeah. You know, is there a progression mm. whereby I do three months training, I know it has enhanced my ability to connect to income. Are we together? Mm, yes. So federal government can't go into each state and be doing that. I agree with yeah, you. I agree with, yeah, you. I agree with you. But the, the point that I'm because the, the point that I believe you are making is if the nation is going to be productive in terms of human capital, the states have to contribute. That's what you're saying. Well primarily. Wait, wait, wait. All tiers of government have to contribute. Okay. There are things that the federal government could do alone. There are things that, well, you have federal universities, you have state too. And there, but are things that states, in states. there are things that states must do alone, and there are things that they must do in concert. Mm. And there are also things that local government. But the point is that the relative responsibility of each across activities will not be always the same. Well, okay, you know, doctor, my apologies, okay. Nero. Dr. Nevin said something very, very interesting, which is why I'm trying to get this. He said, we, you, he, uh, Alero asked that question again about us returning to manufacturing, which according to Alero worked for us way before now. And these things happen in the States. Even the federal government is located in the States, well, except Apuja. You know. So that, that's the reason that I'm asking that question. If the states have their own roles cut out for them. Is that that collaboration, that, well, Andrew, that, that national vision Andrew, that we're all working towards? Andrew addressed the subject. And one of the things he said is about the lack of competitiveness. Unless we can guarantee the adequate supply of power. energy. Mm. Yeah. And you can guarantee seamless transportation, you'll be discussing manufacturing in vain wow. because yeah. the costs will make that activity unreasonable. Yeah. That so, is so, a federal and government responsibility. Collective, you know, who solves telecoms problem? Is it federal government? You know, it's, it's a collective responsibility, but will be spearheaded, you know, at the federal mm. level. The point is, you, you need to sequence, you know, you have certain prerequisites that you must put in place before you can expect manufacturing to happen. To thrive. Um, for example, 20 years ago, our telecom sector was in infancy. So you can't be talking of ICT, or you can't be talking about e-business growing. Mm. Then the Telephones have to ring first. Yes. <laughs> then you can talk about data. Yes. Then you can talk about building structures on mm. it. So it was wise of Nigeria to resolve telecoms mm. in 2001. Mm. And we are on the path in which you've seen explosion, new ways of creating wealth and connecting with the world. So it would be wise for Nigeria to turn attention to the other things that need to be fixed. For example, power transmission. Yeah. For example, rail transport. Um, if you were doing telecoms the way you are doing rail now, you, are, you, were, you were going to borrow from a particular country to build, you know, piecemeal build the telecoms network, you would not have got anywhere. You haven't got anywhere with rail. Use the approach that you used in telecoms, yeah. in which you opened to investors, mm. and if, you know, saturated the space. Do it in real, do it in transmission, liberalize, attract investment. It's going to solve the fiscal problem. It's going to solve the infrastructure problem. It's going to empower manufacturing, etc. Basically, that's the kind of conversation. There are things we must do in concert. But after the concerted effort has been taken, there are things that each state must then zoom in on. This is what affects me. This is what I can do 
to create a difference, not just to human capital, to physical capital. Mm -hmm. You know, each state, the federal government is not going to come and help you to solve the reason why uh, your own central business or your city centers are not safe, or why they are dirty. You know, you can generate economic activity just by in restoring orderliness at these market centers, whether you do, you will, might too. So as long as the nuisance in those spaces are there, they will obstruct wealth creation, mm. and your people will be the poorer for, for it. it. Mm. Uh, Dr. Dr. Nevin, um, both of you have agreed that our problem is a revenue problem. And you also pointed out that, or oh, was it Dr. Teriba, pointing about taxation, that uh, there's no point in increasing taxes when people's incomes are not increasing. In fact, they are, their spending is increasing, but their incomes are not increasing. So let's look at this revenue problem, which you both have spoken about. How can we, how can Nigeria begin to shore up its revenue, seeing that its expenditure in the budget is so high? Yeah, I, a very good question. But I mean, let, let's start with the fact that you know, why do some people, we have low tax morale, as my colleague Kai Wolf calls it in our, in our studies at PwC. Why do people have low tax morale? They have low tax morale because there's the perception that the tax money is not used wisely. So we look over the last number of years, we continue to pour subsidies into Agio Kutsa steel, and there's no steel. In fact, it was just reported that the nation spent 100 million US dollars resolving legal issues to be able to move forward. We continue to, to subsidize the refineries, and there's no refined product. We continue to spend over 6 trillion naira this year on, or sorry, last year, on the foil subsidy. Uh, on that, which is a, we talk about as a complete waste. So, and then we have this multiplicity of agencies. And of course, when people pay their taxes, they don't get a commensurate level of services. They don't get education. They don't get health care. They don't get infrastructure. They don't get security. They don't get um, uh, energy, uh, any sort of electric access. So then they go out and have to pay, their, pay themselves that. So in a sense, there's this myth, and the World Bank has contributed, that we're a low-tax uh, environment, and we need to collect additional tax revenue. But that's, in fact, it's completely false. I mean, as we said on this show today, there's over 50 different taxes. There's a lot of charges that are not called taxes. They're just called fees in some way for a particular MDA. There's informal charges. And then once you pay all of those charges and taxes, you then have to go out and supply all those services that, in fact, the taxes are supposed to be uh, pay for. So but it's a very difficult situation on that on that fiscal side from that. Um, and you know, in that environment, I mean, I don't think the federal government should be looking at this as a revenue problem. They should be looking at it as the wisdom of their spending. I mean, if we're going to have people willingly pay their taxes and be prepared to pay more taxes, there has to be the perception that the taxes are used wisely. And as we continue to divert them into things that are not productive for the nation, I mean, we've said before, we put out the paper that said Nigeria is a very rich country. We have an enormous amount of assets, particularly real estate. But these are dead assets. They're not producing a return for, for the country, like Agio Foods and Steel on that. So rather than try to extract more from the population in the way of revenue growth, I think the better solution would be to be able to tell a better story to the population about how the existing taxes are being used and to convince people, in fact, that the, the social contract is one that's, that, is, that is fair. But right now, there's the perception that the money that's raised from the population is not used wisely. In that circumstance, it's very difficult to try to raise more money. So in that way, I think that the federal government has not necessarily addressed the core issues around, around the taxation and fiscal, the fiscal issues. OK. So that is that. But then it also, I don't know what your take it would be on the conversation. I mean, you raised the issue of the responsibility of the states, or rather the collaboration or contribution of the subnationals to national GDP and all of those things. I heard some of the things that Dr. Teriba said about that, what role the states have to play, especially about empowering people and all of that. So. I'm wondering if there is anything, any direct, because my, my challenge hitherto had always been that of a, a need for some form of national cohesion. So um, the, the different states know what to contribute into the pool so that we can all be going in the same direction. 
Yeah, so let me let me just start out by saying, I mean, I've, I've raised a lot of the challenges that the country faces, but I mean, these challenges are all well known. I personally remain incredibly optimistic about the future of Nigeria. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm optimistic is because, in fact, in the last decade, we've really seen the states step up, some of the states step up and really show how they can develop their own states. And if I had to take an analogy, when India had a major economic crisis in the early 1990s, they actually had to airlift their gold to the Geneva vaults to get a loan from the IMF. And they basically said to the states, you need to start to figure out your own economic strategy. And that has worked out incredibly well for them in the last 30 years. And I was just in India, I think I was in five different states in my uh, time over the holiday. Uh, and each state has a different strategy, economic strategy. Some states are starting to do incredibly well. But we're beginning to see that here. And I'll just cite, I'll cite uh, Edo State as an example, His Excellency Governor Obaseki. I mean, let me give you three economic pillars that he has that are working very well. One of them is around agriculture and agri agro uh, value chains and being able to attract investment, particularly around palm oil. One of them is around cultural industries and new museum that's opening up in Benin City. And of course, the return of Benin bronzes and incredible story to tell about the Benin Empire. The third one is about upskilling young Nigerians to be able to insert themselves in global value chains as developers, software developers. He has a target of 35,000 young people for that. But, but the point I want to make is he has an economic strategy. The state has an economic strategy and it's being executed. And that's where value is going to be created. And every state has different uh, attributes that they can draw on. Kaduna has a very strong economic strategy. Of course, Lagos has been doing this for 20 years. Ogun is very strong in education and manufacturing. Um, and more and more states you're finding have governors that recognize unless they take the responsibility for their economic strategy, the states are not going to develop. So at one level, it's also important for the population in each state to elect governors uh, who are going to advance the state's, the state's interests. So Dr. Taraba is exactly right. We need the states and the federal government working together. But I think it's been very encouraging. We have now the Excellency Governor Saluto in a number, for example, who has put together a very good economic strategy. And I think have no doubts it's going to be successful. And as more and more states take responsibility for their own economic future, uh, then I think we're going to be, we're going to find Nigeria emerges much stronger over the next decade. So I'm very optimistic about that. And if, one of the things that's interesting, you know, or I've been a little bit critical of the World Bank on this program and at other venues, but I think one thing the World Bank has done very well is recognize um, the incredible role of subnationals in Nigeria. I think that this is the first country, because the World Bank normally works, uh, World Bank with the federal government in every country. This was the first country, if I understand right, where the World Bank started to work with the subnationals, and that has been very, very successful uh, in many ways in terms of their fiscal frameworks for subnationals, their economic strategy for that on that. So I'm really optimistic about it. I think more and more states are going to end up with governors that are moving them in the right direction. And they're going to have their own distinctive economic strategies. I, we were at an amazing session, for example, that was run by Francis, uh, who is, was just stepped down as the head of uh, the AFCFTA secretariat in, in Nigeria. And he brought the states together for the states to figure out what is their strategy in the context of AFCFT. So this is not what is Nigeria's strategy. This is at an individual state level. We have a continental free trade agreement. What can your state do to that? And the results were really, really promising about it. So it really gives me cause for optimism in Nigeria. Mm. Well, Dr. Teruba, these issues are just not going to go away. Now, Dr. Nevin spoke about some low-hanging fruits the other time. That I mean, there was something you said earlier, and you know, my colleague Alara said we'll come back to it. What are those things we need to do in order to shoot down those prophecies? Right. Um, I'd like to say a bit more on two of the issues that Dr. Nevin has put on the table uh, regarding the government revenue mix. Okay, so we see the government, you know, federal and state, uh, striving to get more revenue through taxes. Unfortunately, the tax base is shrinking. The economy has been in recession for most of the past eight years. So even if you, you know, do annual, annual finance acts, point is, this year, from the energy shock, from the food shock, you need to find, go and try and find out how many factories have shut down and how many workers 
have been quietly laid off. You read global headlines, you know, uh, about tech companies shedding workers. Yeah. You are not going to read any headline about, you know, companies in Lagos, companies in Ibadan, shutting down. They shut down quietly. So by the time you finish doing your finance acts, the corporates that you expect to pay the taxes have shut down. The staff that you expect to pay the taxes have been laid off. So you are not going to get more from tax revenue. Now, you have to then compare. There are some countries that do not rely on taxes. Is that people pay no income tax. Corporate taxes are no, low or, or zero. <laughs> Yet they get more funding, they get more revenue, government revenue, than those of us that talk about tax, 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 and tax. Um, uh, UAE just capped 30% tax on alcohol. Okay, we are introducing tax on alcohol, on sugar, on tobacco. So what? And more taxes what, on the what digital sustains economy. them? What makes them able to do? So the government in such climes. Uh, Focus on assets, just like Andrew has said, how to get fees on government assets, whether the assets are tangible or intangible. The kind of licensing fees that individuals who don't pay taxes in UA we pay will be more than enough to compensate for the fact that you don't pay taxes. The kind of fees that companies have to pay to operate will be more than enough to come, and then they get those fees up front. Whereas you have to wait and get taxes in areas, that's if you get it, are we together? Mm -hmm. So we need to think more about assets. If you look at assets that litter across all the states, uh, he has mentioned real estate. Which state is making any reasonable sum of money from this real estate? They own the bulk of it. So if you find any real estate that is yielding high returns, it's probably not owned by the state. So we are talking of the, the value of real estate lies in this place value. So if you have a mall where a lot of billions have been unlocked per square meter, it's not owned by the state. If it were owned by the state, you know, it would be clogged down by disorder, you know, Traf human traffic competing with vehicular traffic, <laughs> you know, hoodlums, and hood privileges, hoodlums, hood 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 you know. So if states can pay more attention to that, it doesn't have to be shopping malls run by private sector alone that can unlock wealth. That government overseen markets, you don't have to run it yourself. You can do PPP. You can contract agents that will run those spaces the way private sector will run. If you need, you, you, if you have a five-star hotel or seven-star hotel that is thriving in some other countries, you, states rival, you know, with with private sector. If you find residential area that uh, sane and normal, well organized, mm -hmm. creating, well, it's in the private hand, but, and but that no, applies so. to all of the states. In in the past. States, regions, for example, Western region. If we were what looking was. for best examples in real estate, it was the government. If we were looking for the best hotels, <laughs> it was the government. I went together. Doctor, well, you are the people who also say that government has no business in business. Government has every business in business. You can do oh, the public has private push. You can do public private partnership. You you are doing joint venture in LNG. So, and you've liberalized investment in telecoms. So why neglect real estate? Why waiting for tax revenue when you can make money from your... You have tourist centers that is owned by government, will always be owned by government. If you look at other countries, they've contracted private managers who secure the space. They make them safe. They amenitize the place. Are we together? Yeah. So basically... Then in the way you talk about manufacturing, you talk about you know value. At the end of the day, is also the extent to which the farmers in your state or the uh, artisans in your state uh, are protected by the state. We talked about skill certification, mm. but also they need you know some protection 
in terms of the supplies that they get, unless the state, state supports them. They need some protection in terms of access to the market. Your, the, your populace is in rivalry with corporate, particularly foreign corporate giants who mm -hmm. confine them to the farmland or confine them to the factory. But the biggest gains are outside of the factory, either before the factory or you know, in the approach to the market from the factory. The same with the farm. Mm. So unless states secure advantages for their citizens, you know, working in those places, we keep talking vaguely about, you know, agriculture, talking vaguely about manufacturing. And mm. foreign companies will come and cut the surpluses away and leave the populace perpetually uh, impoverished. Mm. And I also see uh, the example of the Western region in those days. They were creating, you know, value chains of their own. They were branding, you know, products. The Western region had Lafia Canning oh. Factory, mm -hmm. which is Spawnman today. <laughs> it's been <laughs> And a lot of other interventions in different value chains. So states can sit back and wait for the private sector to do it and tax them. State also has to join the free. Mm. And he mentioned dead assets. How much money can we generate from our idle assets? We're talking of Finance Act. How soon will we be talking about Investment Act mm. to make, make sure that you talked about real estate, but there is infrastructure? And we have companies whose market value we don't even know. All that Saudi, you know, has done to reveal the value of Aramco in his balance sheet is to list it in the stock market. But you haven't spoken about those things that you said we needed to do. You wanted to talk about that earlier. That's all I've been saying. Okay. I just what? wanted to be sure that I mean that's out of the bag because you started okay. by addressing. Okay. So should I itemize? Should okay. I itemize? I quickly, quickly. Complement fee-based revenue. Mm -hmm. uh, Complement tax-based revenue mm -hmm. with fee-based revenue and attract investment into assets. The investment, when it arrives, is revenue. Yeah. And if you successfully revive a debt asset, for example, when you attracted LNG, the investment into LNG, from nothing, they brought out something. It opens up new revenue streams. The telecoms company did that. So when investment arrives, it gives revenue on arrival. It then opens up new revenue streams that didn't exist before. So we're saying debt, we are going to borrow the money to invest in infrastructure, dry cutting on that model. Okay. Investors are better able to invest in infrastructure than you. Okay, you don't need to borrow 30 year money at 8%, mm. dollar money. So what, what kind of infrastructure is going to yield such vision? But investors know how to you know, get lumpy sums mm -hmm. and put. We, okay. We've got in telecoms, we should get in rail, in transmission, okay. and the rest of it. I will ask this question in parentheses. Um, <laughs> I have said something about multiple taxation. Some companies are paying as many as 30 different taxes. 50. Is it that government is not aware that that is killing business? Oh, well, um, this is where acting in concert is important. Each government is trying to survive. They're feeling the pinch of declining revenue, and they have to survive. So well, the you, have to understand, the yeah, you have to understand where they are coming from. So that's not to say, so unless you all... What's the motivation in UAE for scrapping 30% alcohol tax? They obviously have seen that it is in their interest to scrap it. They probably get more revenue by scrapping it, you know, because it will encourage motorists, they say, <laughs> to come to, <laughs> to the UAE so and the motorists you get. So the states, we should have a conversation. It's such that states can also see the benefit of tax relief, you know. And mm -hmm. our tax relief could boost some other 
revenue yes. inflow. Even when such revenue inflow are not taxes. Okay, we've run completely out of time. So, Dr. Nevin, may I have your first, your last word on Nigeria's spending in 2023? In one minute, please. Dr. Nevin, we can't hear I'm you. I'm sorry, go ahead. Okay, no, go, go ahead. I'm here. Just yes. please repeat the question. Your last word on Nigeria's spending in 2023. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think we all understand the budget is about 20 trillion and we continue to have almost 4 trillion that goes on to the uh, FOIL subsidy. I think we have close to 6 trillion, if I remember right, on interest payments. So, you know, not a lot of spending left for other things. But as I said a little bit earlier in the program, I mean, I really think that the this debate is too often around the um, micro details of the budget and not enough about the overall social contract between people that are governed and people paying taxes and the government. And I said, I think the government has has uh, not in the last number of years addressed the fundamental issues, either with what I discussed before in terms of um, uh, ease of doing business, where you know they talk about it but haven't addressed it, nor have they really addressed it in terms of the spending priorities. We all understand how much, for example, NAS costs. We understand the multiplicity, the cost, the multiplicity of the agencies. We understand the cost of uh, things like Agia Kusa Steel and the refineries. And because the government has not addressed those fiscal issues that are wasteful and not really advancing the country socially or economically, the people are you know, rightly asking the question about whether they should pay, pay more money. And I think unless they address the fundamental issues, uh, you know, the next regime that comes in, we're going to continue to struggle in Nigeria. I think the good news, though, however, is that the fact that these issues are are so well known, the debates are all about really the core issues. I think people, many people understand the need to address real fundamental reform in whatever form it takes. I, as I said, I continue to be very optimistic over the next decade for Nigeria. Oh, okay, we hope we can all be optimistic. Dr. Terry, the last <laughs> word, please. <laughs> oh, well, um, that it's important, you know, not to put the cat before the house. Um, budgets in Nigeria tend to have more to say on sectoral allocation of money than on where to get the, the money. money from. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you have a capital spending plan of six trillion and you can't even spend two trillion out of it. Government should pay more attention to where to find revenue by you know looking at what they can get from assets from fees. And government should, you know, maybe declare a ceasefire on debt issuance <laughs> and issue only equity so that they get on the same page with the, our peer countries who are getting a lot more from investment. India targets 100 billion FDI inflow annually. You know, and Brazil is not doing any poorly. Saudi is joining, Egypt is joining. Nigeria should join that place. Dr. Ayo Terry Ba, CEO of Economic Associates, who was with us in our studio in Lagos, as well as Dr. Andrew Nevin, advisory partner and chief economist at PricewaterhouseCoopers Nigeria. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. For coming to keep our eyes focused on our spending in 2023. Interestingly, we didn't talk about this election spending, but that's not part of the conversation, so we can go. Don't look at me like that. Uh, Thank you. Sunrise will be right back <laughs> in a moment with another interesting conversation. Do join us. <laughs>
Is there an OEMF bus stop? Oh yes, College Road <laughs> in Lagos. <laughs> <laughs> well, OEMF Grammar School is in Akure. Well, this one is in Akure. I don't know if there's any other one elsewhere. But it was founded on Tuesday, January 29. Oh, so precise, on Tuesday. January 29, 1953. And by the way, we're going to bring that human calculator. He'll tell you the dates, the day of your birth. Yes, and that's 71 years ago. Well, it was by a group of Akure community leaders with the support of the Anglican Communion under the leadership of the Deji of Akure Land, His mm -hmm. Royal Highness Oba Afumbiwo Adeshida I. Guess what? That school started with just 30 students. What's funny? Don't mind her. She's she's had a little bit of you know the, an entire school, just yeah. thirty students started. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I heard. That's what happens when you take some sugar. But of course, the school is the first secondary school to be considered and approved for what has now become WIAC in Form Five in 1957. Form Five. Wow. That's against the normal Form Six which was the official policy at the time. Mm -hmm. Well, I could go on and on about that because I have quite a, a script with me, but it's not just about the school, it's about the celebration of the 70th Founders Day of the school, and three gentlemen are with us this morning. The national president of the alum, alumni of the school, I believe, Dr. Ni Jogun. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much for having us. Chairman, Central Planning Committee, Mr. Olatunde Adeji Igbe, SAN. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. And one of my colleagues, you know, he's entitled to give me a query if I called him with a title. I'll give you a knock on the head. I'll give me a knock on the head. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> a distinguished alumnus, Ron Ubatogo. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much. For you having must us. miss the Otherwise known as Ronnie Boy. <laughs> <laughs> you must miss the microphone. I do, I do. My first love. Your first love, huh? absolutely. Mm. But that back then you didn't have a lapel to use. No, no. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Unidirectional. Don't don't bother about those days. <laughs> <laughs> but we're still going to those days somehow because well, um American Grammar School, Akure, you know, seventy years old. Let me ask you first of all, since they call you distinguished alumnus. Uh, of the school, uh, any memories for those who are aspiring? Or those who are <laughs> memories, <thinking>? memories are plenty. <laughs> are plenty. You know, <clears throat> uh, Oyemeku was a young school when I joined in 1959. Was just two years old then. Oh, just, no, uh, just, uh, just six uh, years old. Yes, six years old then. And uh, beautiful, small quiet, ancient town of Akure. Mm. Beautiful, small, ancient, revered, loved, cherished. Then I came into Yemeku in 1959. And as you said in your intro, five years upon inauguration of the school, they sat for the West African School Certificate examinations and scored very highly. So that's why when we say up school, they would say the only school, the only school. school. because <laughs> then only very few schools could do the school certificate examinations after five years. Others spent six years. So the teaching staff was very excellent when I joined. And so I want to talk about three people who are very brilliant, good teachers. One was Reverend W. R. B. Kuye, M.A. Dublin, 1919. <laughs> he taught me Latin. I didn't do so well in Latin, but that's what. So, expectedly. Pre expectedly. <laughs> Uh, because my native language is Igbo. <laughs> so, so Latin was very far from my... However, you know, that's why the motto of the school is Pro Deo et Patria. For God and our fatherland. 
and country. A wish that is internalized not properly by those who lead us. But that's another matter. That's WRB Queer. Uh, MA Dublin 1919. The other person is Reverend Richard Childerstone, a Scotman. He got me interested in the English language. The third person was the guy that my papa chose to be my guardian, Mr. C.J.C. Obwe. Even though then we all called him Obwe, but his real name is C.J.C. Obwe. He taught history, and he hoisted his trousers up from up to his waist by putting his left hand permanently in his pocket so as to hold the trouser up. But he was a brilliant history teacher. So I remember those three especially. And uh, one other memory that stands very clearly in my mind was when a man who eventually became Dr. Carl de Jegede, who became the head of the Nigerian Law School here in Lagos, when he, he, who was also one of the pioneer students of Uyemeko, when he was now leaving school to go to the university. And we lined up on the Appian Way to see him out of school, having been from Form 1 to Form 5, head boy, and now, and taught for a while, and I was leaving school to go to university. So we sang for him, uh, God be with you till we meet again. We make was a beautiful place. Absolutely first class. Okay. We, we could make a movie out of that. But you're have to <laughs> so let me come to you, Dr. Ejogun. You're going to have to tell us your own memories as well. Maybe not as old as his. Uh, of course. Because I, I would have before. loved to ask him how he, how he felt. Uh, when Nigeria became independent in one year after he joined school, but I'm not going to ask him that, or maybe some other time. Okay. What are your own memories in two minutes? Thank you very much. I, we make home, uh, has always been a school that uh, is known for excellence. Uh, it's a school that stands out among equals. And uh, like, uh, we're to, like you've uh, rightly mentioned, that is the only school. So it's a school that has produced a lot of uh, distinguished uh, personalities in different spheres of life. And uh, we're actually very proud that uh, we, we here are representing almost about uh, 25,000 uh, uh, graduates of the school. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have ambassadors, we have uh, ministers, we have head of service in different uh, states, we have commissioners, and even in other spheres of life, we have uh, quite a lot. And uh, going back to your question, while I was in school, um, I uh, noticed the discipline in the school. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the core values that we have in the school. I remember uh, some of our teachers, uh, the, the president, uh, just the uh, principal that uh, was principal then when I was there, is, uh, Reverend Ogunladi, he was a very uh, tough man, a disciplinarian to the core. And um, I remember when he comes, when he shows up from his, uh, from his uh, office, all of us we run scatter, uh, scatter. Naturally. You know, we, we disappear within seconds. So it's uh, and I'm one of them that actually uh, disappeared one of those days. And I remember falling down in the process. And he came to uh, lift me up. Oh, so yeah. it was a lot of panic on my mind. Incidentally, I don't know uh, what uh, made him to spare me that day. So I didn't follow him to his uh, office. So those are one of those things that uh, I can remember this group for. And doctor, while you were talking, Friday Jibbe was nodding away. Were you, were you, were you contemporary? He <laughs> no, was my senior. Okay. He was my senior. By two so years. you experienced this principal as well? Yes, I know, of course. Yeah, I was there. And Reverend Jibbe was there. Okay. And of course, it was an interesting time when, you know, the, the principals and teachers could hold their own. I remember telling somebody some days ago that uh, Chief Ogunladi, as principal of Yemekun Grammar School, drove a Mercedes Benz. So you could not even afford to look down on him, you know. And of course, from he came from Christ School to Yemeko, and it was because of that top rating that had those first class principals. 
So in those days, you would benchmark Oyemeku Christ School and of course Aquinas College. You know, and for everyone, that was like the first, if you, you the way you use it today, when they say the Ivy League, yeah, at that time, those are the schools you want to go to. Mm. And the competition was very stiff. And just like the national president has said, um, this is the school that has produced a lot of giants in various fields. Professor Collier Motoshaw. Including yourself. Including myself. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Senior Ladi. advocate of yes, Nigeria. Ladi Absolutely. Malekun, you know, and a host of judges, um, those who are served as ministers, architects, you know, a number of them. Now, we so, know you are marketing the school, and it's, it's normal. But <laughs> what experience do you have? I'm looking back. The experience I had. Now, I, I schooled in Lagos in primary school. And mm. so for me, being taken out of Lagos to go to school in Nondosti, because my parents come from Akure, was a new experience. And so I was also one of the youngest in my set. But one thing is that because I've had uncles who also went to the school, and of course had a lot of things they said about the school, it put my mind at rest. And now the experience of having to do what we call uh, manual labor, being <laughs> given a portion, and then of course coming from the place where a part of the thing in my, for my boarding school was O and Cutlass. Those are the things. What <laughs> Please, what do you mean being given a portion? No, ah, give portion it. of what? You have to. You have to have a place you have to cut yes. that is your own that you maintain. A portion on the school field, but is is allocated to you. There were no long mowers at that yeah. time. That's what allocated. Allocated. <laughs> you know, I went to school in Lagos. I don't know. I don't know this. It's allocated to you. A yes. Of it's land. Yes. yes. Somebody will tell you a portion. I have to clear. So it's given there. And it is hmm. measured with the leg. Yeah, so you <laughs> must maintain it. <laughs> How come sure. you know about all this? Yeah, because stuff. I went to boarding school. <laughs> <laughs> you must make sure it's well manicured. Uh, it's well kept. So that was the experience. Well, so, uh, okay. It seems like I'm, I'm, I'm bringing up some memories here. <laughs> but let's go to the Founders Day arrangement, uh, Dr. Yogo. So what's the plan this time around? Thank you very much. The plan is uh, to showcase the school the values of the school. Uh, we plan to have a week-long uh, activity. Okay. And uh, we, uh, let me just correct uh, an impression here that uh, Webekun was founded on a Tuesday. It's not, it's actually a Thursday. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry for the, uh, for the mix-up somewhere. Apology, but, guy, guy. Okay, it's so Thursday, Thursday, uh, 29th, 1953. That's when the school was actually founded. Um, so we, we have a lot of activities, and uh, I will uh, allow the CPC chairman, that is the Central Planning Committee okay. chairman, to take us through the uh, various uh, activities. Is any of those, of are any of those activities happening in Lagos or it's all in Akure? No, it's a homecoming, so it's all in Akure. Everyone is coming to Akure? Yeah. Yeah, so including those people a, in diaspora. I hope you have an, a, an, a, an airstrip that people are going to land. I'm well, just there's people in diaspora there's an airport, and those yeah. permanently away from that. <laughs> 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 there's definitely um, there's airport in Akure. So okay, so what are, what's, what's the plan this time? Now, one major thing we have uh, embarked upon, because uh, government over the years, due to paucity of funding, have not been able to maintain the structures in the school. So one of the things that is it is, a government school? Sorry. Yes, government school. Oh. Although started by the community, but over the of course later government took over the schools. Right now they are making plans to give, give the schools back. back because what, the to the Anglican Communion. Well, now it's going to be more like a tripartite arrangement: the alumni, the Anglican Communion, and the Akure community. So it's coming back under a canopy of those three groups. So one of the things we embark upon is to ensure an upgrade of infrastructure because most of the classes are nothing to write home about. Mm -hmm. I mean, we all knew what it was like when we were in school and we are trying as much as possible to bring it close to that. So the projects are ongoing, uh, they are at advanced stage, but they surely will be ready for commissioning by the time we kick off the celebration. And when is this? It's starting on the 23rd. Okay. To the yes, 29th. Now, you said, you know, there are, it's a week long of activities. Yes, yes. What are some of these activities? Of course, we will start off with, um, there's a road show, because this is, is what we used to do. We go around the town, and then that will culminate in a visit to the Deji of Akure, who incidentally is also an alumnus of the school. Mm -hmm. And so we have that. Uh, we have a procession in the mm -hmm. evening. Um, we're going to have 
a career talk for the students. We're having a lecture. Now the lecture this time is talking about rebuilding the building walls, the broken walls of education, the role of the alumni. Because the alumni has now become the backbone for the school. There will be novelty match, and there will, of course, be a dinner and awards night, among other things. So we're having arts and science exhibition by the students, as well as cultural display. In Taos Plus, we'll feature during the week. These are part of the things we have put together. Is Mr. Ambatog going to play? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking. Are you, no. are you going to be on the field? Uh, the, the, my jersey isn't quite ready. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> are you sharing the same thing with uh, Cristiano Ronaldo? I'm just saying. Oh, <laughs> no. Pelé. Oh. Number 10, right? Number 10, you of know, uh, the, the jersey isn't just ready. That's, uh, right. I hope it will be ready. Oh. Yeah, it's on the reserve anyway. So <laughs> we are, we are, it's on the reserve. So the 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 the, uh, the, the coach has said. Oh, the coach. The coach. Yes. Oh. <laughs> I see. So what are some of those things that you believe that people should be looking for to those who would come, and what would be your motivation? Oh, that he said, uh, uh, Mr. DG with SAM said, you know, it's a homecoming. Every activity will be in Akure. I haven't been in Akure. I, I was last in Akure in 19... 19... They're here 19? <laughs> That's more than 20 years ago. Yeah, certainly yeah, quite a long, a long time ago. Um, towards the end of uh, the 20th century was when I was there in, in Akure. So to be in Akure now will be really, really something. Mm -hmm. And so I believe that you know, those who are coming, uh, Alero was saying, talking about those who are permanent uh, uh, people who in... Who are permanently away. Away. <laughs> they will join a, a brand new kind of school. Because you know, by the time all of those infrastructure is upgraded, school will be beautiful to behold again. For those who knew it, you know, when it was in its prime. And uh, also we take in the, the atmosphere of Akura as a state capital. It was a sleepy town before, but mm -hmm. it's now a big city. Yeah. And so hosting all of these people who are coming in, not only from Nigeria, will be something to behold. And that's really what I'm looking forward to. I'm looking forward to seeing lots of old faces and then meeting new faces. Yeah. Well, hmm, interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm expecting that there is going to be some form of carnival because walking around town, you can't just be walking around town. It's going to be a no. It's it. It is. And yeah, I mean, you can't just be walking without in, in much or something. No, state, no, there's, state capital. there's a lot of merrymaking. And what what kind of things are is it going to be corn, cassava, things like that? that there will be, two, be a lot of Bando. local delicacies. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you you remember some of okay. Do you remember some of those delicacies that you had when you were in school? Well, you know, the one that I remember very well was the one we call it Pekere. <laughs> that, one is, that, that one is modern. <laughs> no, Pekere is not. No, no, at that time. Yeah. Oh. You and I call it plantain chips. We call it the real name. Pekere. That's what that's the name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, I know I'm a Yoruba man. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, calm down. Calm down. No, 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 no. Yes. Oh, it's P. It's P. It's a P. It's P. It's not a P. It's not P. It's a 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 Okay, so what kind of support are you um, calling for? Because I see that some of the, the, the ceremonies include, uh, uh, as he has mentioned, will also include cultural display, arts and science exhibition. I understand this. Well, we'll talk about that football, football match and, and all of that. But what, what kind of support are you looking at? What kind of, um, because, you know, those who are coming from outside Nigeria would definitely be might be wary of a thing or two. So what kind of arrangements are there? How, what's the motivation for them to come back home? Thank you. Um, what I've, I will tell you is that uh, in terms of security, because from anybody coming, 
from the diaspora, the first thing on their mind is uh, security, security because of uh, what the situation is in the country. So we've made the arrangement, we are in partnership with the Nigerian police force in Ondo State and we've got commitment of uh, the State Commissioner of Police that we are going to have adequate uh, police protection. And uh, incidentally, some of our old students are also high up there in the uh, Nigerian police force and, in, and also in and the teachers. military. As, as, uh, in general. And also we have um, the Federal Road Safety Corps. The, we've got assurances from them. They, mm. they told us we are going to have a smooth uh, traffic uh, situation within that time, particularly during the road show, that they are going to uh, ensure that there is uh, law and order and there's going to be free flow of traffic. Mm. And also uh, we made them realize that uh, we make is our pride and we want the spectators along the lines of uh, we make them, uh, oh. street, we make them, uh, highway, and also the current roads in generally to be well uh, controlled. Yeah. So we have all those in place, and um, we are calling on the support of the of the government. We we are uh, almost getting uh, an appointment with this with the state uh, uh, no. governor now, and uh, we are sure because of uh, of his interest in in what we are doing and mm. education as a as a, in general that um, is going to give us an audience, and we we want uh, beyond an audience, we want uh, him to also look into the infrastructure decay that we have in the school, that we the uh, old students are trying to uh, uplift. And uh, we've done incredibly well because uh, during the program, we'll be launching nothing less than about six projects. And that is uh, really commendable that mm. uh, we can all put heads together to fund that kind of project. Mm. So it's really uh, something that we look forward to as, uh, as our pride. Mr. Dejibwe, yes. 70 years, that's a long time. Yes, it is. So I, I, I imagine that there'll be a whole lot of you gathering for this celebration true i mean is there enough infrastructure in akure to cater for all of you considering that most of you are now in high places more, more than enough <laughs> no akure has good hotels uh, and of course that is a state that has been there uh, since 76 so there is quite a number i mean there are quite a number of hotels in town and good places to visit and like we said, it's homecoming, so there is even more of more, more place of interest that people can visit. Because for a whole week, you don't want boredom, so you want a place to be, you know, full of activity and keep everybody, you know. Uh, so what kind of places have you lined up to take the old students to when they come to for that celebration? Okay, now because, like you said, we are really mindful of security, but at the same time. You know, there are places that are not too far to go to. You have the Donre Hills, which is not far from Akure, and people can still visit. And then you have some resorts on the outskirts of town that are lovely that you can visit. Uh, I don't know if you've heard about the Dome. There's a place called the Dome in Akure. It's, um, it was done when Governor Mimiko was there. So it's, it's a place at least you visit and you'll be happy that uh, you are here. Mm -hmm. Then there's the anniversary dinner. Yes. But before you go there, yes. I want to ask you about the cultural display. What kind of cultural display are we going to have? Is it a gugu or a yo or, <laughs> or a gunu? No, no. I'm it just, is, yeah, yeah. You know, it is true. Lagos, isn't it? Uh, well, no, you never can tell. <laughs> but the, the whole idea is to also allow students mm. to bring, to display their own skills and talents. Mm. You know, Unfortunately, uh, these days, uh, for example, what you can find on the streets, everybody simply talking about Buga, but you don't seem to actually appreciate, you know, the roots of our own heritage. And so we're saying beyond those ones, there are a number of things. You find people on drum and you see them really beat the local drums and you are wondering that, I mean, these talents are there. So those are the things we want to bring back. Mm. Well, uh, Mr. Mbatogu, <clears throat> one of the things, the high points of any community is the language. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I <laughs> can understand the Yoruba in Akure. 
So I'm just wondering, for those who haven't, like you, and as Alera said, have been away, what do you call it? Permanently away. 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 <laughs> <laughs> Communicating with me, of course, might be an issue. Uh, you know, the, the, the beauty of language is that you know, there's a common denominator. Mm -hmm. uh, if I, if I, if, uh, sorry, even Alera herself, you know, knows that the language uh, she, spe she, she spoke in Lagos when she was in secondary school hasn't really changed much. Neither is the language that I knew in uh, Akure uh, changed. Is it so, Akure or Akure? Uh, no, Akure no. For, the, for the locals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but Akure for us who just came in. Uh, if I still say to them, Ekaro, I'm sure they respond. <laughs> okay. So, so we, should, we shouldn't overthink it. No, don't think of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can only wish you the best, you Thank know, you um, you. this. Um, if you need more information, I understand that there is a website, oyemekunalumni.org. That's your website. Yes. So if you need some more information about uh, Oyemeko Grammar School's 70th Founders Day, you can go to oyemekun alumni.org that website will give you some more details. For now we have to thank you very much for being here. Thank National you. President of the Alumni, uh, Dr. Ni Jogun, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. Sir. Chairman and of the uh, Central. We would also like to thank our sponsors and our uh, uh, co- uh, our partners, partners, yes, the, for the, the wonderful job that they're doing okay. towards the uh, anniversary. Okay. It's been very commendable. Thank you. Uh, the Chairman, Central Planning Committee, Mr. Olatunde Adiju Igbe, SAN. Thank, thank, you, thank you so much. Thank you so much. As well as distinguished alumnus of the school, Mr. Ron Mbatogo. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank so you much. very much for having us. Okay. Wonderful yeah. time. This morning. Okay, yeah. hope we've been able to elongate your life a little with the <laughs> memory lane that you went to. We're yeah. back after now to talk about something that you should... I go be your friend. I I Thank you for staying with us this first Saturday of uh, 2023. Every new year, people think about their new year resolutions. I'm not sure they still make them like we used to make them in those days. But um, you begin to turn your attention to ways of improving your life. Um, you will make resolutions which will talk about um, how you're going to become a fitter person, how you're going to become a healthier person, the exercise regime you want to make. Make more money. You know, of course, how to make more <laughs> money. That is a given. There was no point mentioning it because it was number one on that list anyway. <laughs> <laughs> you know, eating healthy, staying healthy, exercising. Oh, okay, I'll go to the gym more often this year. But you don't think about what I consider now, now that I want to talk to her, now that the matter has been raised, one of the most important things, how to reduce your stress. <laughs> Or manage the stress. Well, remember they told us that there was good stress. Yes, that's you stress. No, it's not you you. It's you. you? No, it's not you you. E U. E U stress. Mm. Whatever. <laughs> People don't want any kind of stress if they can help it. Well, they say that you can manage the stress, Sha, and you can. Make sure that it doesn't affect you adversely. But there is a specialist here who will tell us how to achieve that, how to reduce it to the barest minimum, and even if it is there, how to manage it. Founder, team lead, the wellness boss, Chris Ero. Thank Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year. And welcome. Thank you so much. I love your green hair. Ah. Thank and you. the glasses to go with the green <laughs> hair. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> By the way, that's true. You look like, yeah, but it's not very Nigerian. We both got it the is. memo. It's very woman. We both Nigerian got the green memo. You, you <laughs> we got the green memo yeah. today. <laughs> <laughs> we did. <laughs> Good to see you, Chris. Yeah, same here. Happy Great to be to here. You. Great to be here. So, this matter of stress again. 
You've told us that we cannot avoid stress. Mm. Fine. Okay. Now, how do we relieve ourselves of stress? Because stress will come, no matter what we do. Definitely. We will have stress. Definitely. Okay. So, this is a new year. I don't want to be stressed at all this year. Mm. Like they say in Lagos, omojeje. Mm. That's right. Yes. I don't want any kind of stress. But you people tell us that no matter what we do, we will get some stress. Mm. Even the one that you all call the good stress. Mm. <laughs> so when the stress comes, what kind of things can we do to make sure that they don't affect us adversely? Well, first of all, you need to realize what stress is. Okay. Right? And what stress is to you. Okay, let's go there again. What is stress? <laughs> stress is basically your body's response to internal and external stimuli. And when we say stress is, we're not saying some stress is good. We're not saying some stress is bad. We're okay. saying all stress is good. It is oh. our relationship with all stress. Str yes. Ayo, take note. All stress is good. Making stress is just stress. That's what it is. But it's our relationship with the stress that determines if it's good or bad. Our relationship with the stress. Yes, the relationship you have with it. The mindset you have towards it. The perception you have of stress. Now, your perception will actually drive the relationship you build with it. You know, it sounds, it sounds funny when we talk about building a relationship with stress, but it's actually what it is. You have to build that relationship with it. Because over the years, we've built a falsified um, relationship with stress based on notions that are not true. You know, being told stress is bad. So because stress is bad, our relationship towards it is one of avoidance. One of, okay, this is bad for me, I don't need it in my life. So what I'm looking for is things to reduce it, things to relieve me of stress. Rather than looking at stress as, okay, this is good for me. So what are the benefits? Why am I feeling what I'm feeling? So what are the benefits to this thing? By the time you're able to wire your mind that way, it's easier for you to deal appropriately. Perhaps a good way to even begin is to... Um or, you know, one of the first few things to say following this that, that you just made is to even identify whether or not people should actually expect the stress. I ask that because, as you've said, stress is going to come. It's a given. Mm. Whether or not people expect it to come, it's already gotten on the bus. Mm -hmm. It's on the way. Mm -hmm. It's going to come. So... At what point should people, how do I put this? At, at what point, in what way should people prepare or anticipate this stress in a way that will not be adverse? Or is that a good thing to even say, anticipate that stress is going to come? Well, you're not going to anticipate that stress is going to come, but you're going to anticipate that life is going to happen. And, and life could be stress. Life is actually stress. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, really. You know, the thing is, when we think about stress, yeah, most times we think about the, the big experiences that happen to us. We think about the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one. We think about, you know, heavy lack traffic. of money, you know, heavy traffic. We don't think about having to wake up in the morning. We don't think about um, having to think of what to eat or how to pair your clothing so that you look good. That in itself is stressful. You don't think about the joy that comes with meeting someone that you haven't seen in a long while. The excitement of it, that in itself is stressful. So because we all look at the negative experiences. Hold so, on. Yes. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Happiness is stressful? Happiness is stress. It gives you some form of stress. Oh, really? Yes. Okay. Because it gives but you a rush. There's a rush of cortisol that comes in. Yeah, we're too busy being happy <laughs> to realize that it is stress. <laughs> That's why I'm saying it is, you know, an, another person can see that, right? The way, the way you attribute yourself to it can actually turn that into a negative. You know, when you, when you love someone, right, there's a feeling, there's a rush that comes into you. That in itself, where you're going to meet the person or it's, it's, it's a form of stress. It's in your stomach. Exactly. It's a form of stress, but it's good stress, right? But then it becomes bad. When you, when you dwell in it for too long. That's when you know, addiction comes in, obsession comes in. So you now have the negative aspect of that. But on its own, 
it's a good feeling. Okay, now you, you talked about mm. cortisol now. W mm. What does that mean? Cortisol is a hormone that is released when you experience stress. And it's the hormone that okay. actually enables you. So it's generic? Yes, yeah, generic, everybody. So it's a hormone that actually enables you deal with the stress at hand. You know, there are basically two responses to stress. There's a third one anyway. Uh, you either flee, right, flight, fight, or freeze. You know, I mean, you're just frozen. So it's the cortisol that helps you get the energy to do whichever you need to do at that point. So there is energy for freezing. Yes, there's energy for freezing. It takes a lot to stay in one place <laughs> and not do anything. It does take a lot, okay. you know. But, okay, so the... You know, Alero began by talking about New Year resolutions and mm. how people, you know, are mm. looking at the year already. Now, for people who see, it's only natural. I mean, Chris, you've been through this. Yeah. It's only natural for people who have expectations, who have goals set, and uh, they know that it's not going to happen the way I want it to happen. Mm. So that stress is already there, there. on their mind. That look, how is this thing going to happen? So there's that, that pressure that they've given themselves of, oh, how am I going to get this? How am I going to get that? Uh, yeah, I want to get married this year. I want to, you know, mm. have a wife this year. I want to have a child this year. Mm. Things they can control, things they can't control. Mm. Uh, having to deal with narcissistic people, having mm. to deal with wicked people, mm. having to deal with people who are not going in the same direction, direction as you, as you are. Mm. So that's why I talked about whether or not people should expect that the stress is going to come mm. in a particular or from a particular tangent mm. and how to prepare for it. Okay, um, let me start off with talking about this idea, this phenomenon called resolutions, right? Um, you said something just now, you said something about um, people, what they want. I want to have a job, I want to have a car. Uh -huh. The question is, should you? You know, uh -huh. resolutions are basically all about what we want, not what we should have. And then because it's based on what you want, you find that there is this glorified um, um, ambience that you put to it, you know. So you have this highfalutin idea of what you want to do, and then you just lay it out there. It's actually an ego trip for a lot of people when you're talking about resolutions. Oh, I Pause. want to lose weight. Pause. Mm. So someone is way above the societally recommended, you see my fingers are putting in quotes, <laughs> societally recommended a uh, marriageable age. Okay, a lady's mm -hmm. 35. Okay, mm -hmm. for instance, mm -hmm. this guy is already crossing 40. Mm -hmm. He's not married. Mm -hmm. He's not looking in that direction yet. Not because he doesn't want to, but because, as you said, life is happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is he not supposed to and look, in that, look in that direction and want a to get married? Does he want to get married because he wants to get married? Or does he want to get married because he thinks that he should get married due to his age? What's the difference? There's a major difference. <laughs> There's a major he difference. believes that he has got to a, an age where an he age. can look after a wife and, and kids and children. raise a family. Mm -hmm. now when you so he's ready. Got, yeah, you're ready. But what plans have you put in place? What have you put in motion beyond just stating it and saying that, hey, I want to get married this year? Have are you job. making yourself available? Mm -hmm. Are you putting yourself... Have you factored out exactly the kind of woman that you want to get married to? I have. Mm -hmm. I put some money in the bank so that mm -hmm. I can look after her, mm -hmm. so I can pay school fees. Mm -hmm. I have a house. Mm -hmm. I have a car. So all that's left is for the lady to show mm -hmm. up. To show up. So where do you go for the lady to show up? Do you ah. go to church? Do you go to the market? Do you go to the clubs? Ah. You know? So it's, it's a whole factor, but you cannot, you cannot put your life on standstill because you want to get married. The thing is, you just keep moving. You just keep doing what you need to do. And then, you know, there's, there's something about, there's this attraction, the magnetism of it all. It will get to you eventually. But the problem is we're in a rush, we're in a hurry, and we do not have plans in place. Resolutions mostly are not planned. Resolutions are just vague um, pro um, proclamations. Wishes. Yes, vague proclamations. I'm going to have a car. Okay, what kind of car do you want to have? How much do you have in your account? How much does the car cost? How do you plan to pay? Do you even have a space in your home to pack the car? I'm, but do you even know how stressful to pack? already? Is, what you're saying is stressful for me. It's already. not stressful. 
Do you understand? When I say I mean, stressful, when I say stressful, it's not stressful in terms of it being bad. In life, for you to be able to make progress, for you to be able to make any form of um, yeah progress, you need to have a plan in place. You need to have ticks, you know, boxes Chris, that you tick as you go along. Chris, I want to buy a car. Mm -hmm. You're asking me, okay, what kind of car is it? Mm -hmm. And what color is the car? Mm -hmm. And how much is the car? Mm -hmm. I beg now. Then you're not ready. <laughs> well, in fairness to her, when I, 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 desired, I desired a car, mm. right? Um, and I think I mentioned it to one of my colleagues at, the, at my place of work at the time. Mm. And it took about five years or so. When I eventually got the car, the guy was like, you got it finally. I said, did I tell you about it? And he pulled right on the guy. <laughs> you told me five years ago. <laughs> yeah. I said, oh, you told me about it. Five years of stress. Well, not no, five no, years no, of stress, no. five years stress. of planning. Okay. You know, planning. You know that you, you're still talking with that mindset of stress is bad. It's five years of planning. Now, your, your journey will be different from his. Mm -hmm. For someone else, it could take the person a year to get a car, another mm -hmm. person 10 years. Yeah, your, Yours took five years. But it's about what happens in between. in between. What are you doing in between? That's what are you doing core. about it? Exactly. And that is the issue with um, the bad stress or the chronic stress that comes up, the pressure that comes up towards the end of the year, entering the new year, when people are thinking about, ah, oh, but at, this, at the start of 2022, I said I was going to do all these things. This is 2023. I've done nothing. But when they are being wow. very honest and factual with themselves, they realize that you didn't achieve anything because you didn't plan for it. Okay. You were not very, you. very detailed and specific, specific about your actions towards it. No. You, we have this whole personal, professional, moral, financial, social, ETC goals. Yeah. But then there are things that would happen along the line mm. to sometimes truncate, shock, or disrupt the process, mm -hmm. no matter what it is that you're planning. Mm -hmm. The flooding of last year, for instance, mm -hmm. no one planned for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No one planned that you know, such a thing was going to happen to them. Mm -hmm. Again, I ask, uh, is there a way to prepare for the unexpected? You get to the office. You have a good job, mm. and you have colleagues that you love to work with. And mm. for whatever reason, they bring this boss or this subordinate from God knows where. Mm. From hell. <laughs> and all plants, all well-scripted, well-scripted, well-sculptured plants <laughs> get... I don't even have the word for it, simply because someone shows up. Mm. That will bring whatever kind of stress you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Because it's disrupting everything you have laid out specifically, mm -hmm. using your words. Mm -hmm. What happens? Because that's going to happen to someone this it's year. Definitely, it's probably already it's, happening it's to It's definitely going to happen. Again, it's all part of life, as I said. You're going to have to expect bumps in the road. But what are you going to do when you get to the bumps in the road? The thing you're going to do is not when you get to the bump, is before you get to the bump. How are you preparing your shock absorbers, right? Your mental shock absorbers, because everything is all right here. It's actually okay, so a mind game. How do we prepare for shock absorbers? That's what I'm saying. You have to accept the fact, the reality, that things would happen. And then you need to put yourself in a zone where you ask yourself two very important questions. Is this something that I have control over? And is it something that I can change? Those two questions are very key. If it's something that you have control over, then fine, right? Do what you need to do. If it's something you have no control over, then let it go. And let, is it the universe or whatever it is, do their thing. And then you do your own part by ensuring that you stay focused. Now, if I am going there, I know I'm going to the end of this, of, uh, I, mean, I want to get to that wall. And then there are chairs in front of me. Initially, when I envisaged it, there were no chairs, right? And I go like, okay, I'm going to get there straight up. And then eventually, I now find out that there are chairs. Instead of going like, oh, why are the chairs? Why are the chairs? I go, I go like, okay, there's a chair here, but I think I can go around it. 
can I climb the chair to get to where I'm going? If I can't, can I go or around can I it? Remove the chair? Or can I remove the chair? Or can I get someone to help, help me take me. the chair exactly. out? Help me, exactly. So by the time you allow yourself to calm down in the midst of the supposed upheaval, you find that you, you get some bit of clarity regarding what you need to do. It's when we are very emotional, when we get so sentimental about what is going on, we find that we're making decisions that look, that actually turn out to be very bad. You know, because so, at that point, you're not, you're, not, you're not deciding based on logic. You're deciding based on, uh, on emotions. So, yes. Don't panic. Never panic. Cool down and think. Never panic. Never panic. There's something we call BFF, right, in, um, in, in, in stress mastery. You breathe, you feel, and you focus. Breathe is all about you just calming down, giving yourself time to calm down and understand where you are at that point, right? The feel is you are now, what you're feeling, you're trying to understand it. Why am I angry that this chair is here? Okay, is it because I need to get there? Oh, okay, yeah, but why am I angry? Is the anger helping me in any way? No, it's not. Yeah. You remember the yeah. breathing aspect is now calming you down. By the time you discover that, then you now move to focus. Focus. My goal is to get to that wall, and then I find, find a way to get there. Mm. A lot of times we get, we get disgruntled, and then we lose the plot because we are carried up by the emotions. And the funny thing is, no matter the challenge you're going through, you're not the first person to go through the challenge. Why should it not happen to you? Because you find people, at the end of the day, they go, why me? <laughs> why me? Why my life? You know, that pity party. It doesn't help you in any way. Mm. Because why not you? That's the question you should ask. And that's why we talk about the importance of building resilience. You know, that inner strength to be able to forge ahead. Sometimes all of these things, Chris, are so easy to say. But mm. when you get into the, mm -hmm. into the mix, you forget all of these lectures. Mm. If I can understand, you know, mm. if you, you, the next, the initial reaction, we're talking about a, something hap, that happened earlier. The first thing that happens is, for instance, just for instance, you find yourself in the village or in the bush or something, mm. and you unfortunately get a snake bite. Mm. And you, someone tells you how you should have, should have taken, what is that? Bitacula. Bitacula. That's not the first thing in your head. No. The first thing in your head is panic. Is panic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's only natural that that's the first thing that happens to us. So uh, take the example. But the question that I want to ask you mm. is in stress management, as you said, that's or true. building stress, what do you call it? Having a relationship with stress, I don't even know how that works. <laughs> you know, having, you know, building a relationship with stress, mm. we have to factor other people in. Mm -hmm. Because one way or the other, our lives are not independent. Mm -hmm. At work, your job, is, your job is either someone's input or someone's output. At home, your job is either someone's input or someone's output. Among your friends, in church, in the mosque, wherever you find yourself, mm -hmm. you have to relate with people. Mm -hmm. Is there a role for what in management they call emotional intelligence in stress management in such a way that um, other people's stresses don't get to you in a way that you also have mm -hmm. to react emotionally mm -hmm. the way they would? Um, not stress management, more stress mastery. It's mastery. <laughs> yeah, you need emotional intelligence for anything, for everything, right? And it actually, it's actually what helps build in you the sense of uh, individuality. You need to be able to understand that you need boundaries. For a lot of us, we don't have boundaries. Anything goes, right? We are yes people, we want to please everybody. And because we don't have a strong sense of self, it's easier for us to absorb other energies into us. Now, if you have a strong sense of self, you know what you're about, you can actually be in, um, in conversations with people, right? You can actually um, empathize with people without imbibing their pain emotionally, just as you said, because you have drawn boundaries. Now you're talking about um, how, how that is easy to say. Yeah, everything is easier to say. Work is hard. Work is hard. You have to put in the work. You have to be deliberate. You have to be intentional about it. That's why we talk, when we, in wellness, we say it's not, about, it's not about a marathon. I mean, it's not a sprint, sorry. It's a marathon. You go the long distance. You're trying to build a sustainable lifestyle. And you don't get a sustainable lifestyle overnight. You get it by doing little things every day consistently until it becomes a habit. 
okay. know, the last time I was here, we talked about the four E's, where I, I then said at the end that you need to learn to, after talking about the assessing, the appreciation, you know, and all that, we talked about adjusting and, you know, you have to adjust your body to it. You have to adjust your lifestyle to everything that you have assessed. Mm -hmm. And then you need to be able to assimilate it to the point that it becomes your life. But when we shy away from the work that needs to be done, you know, then we shouldn't frown when we get the results that we get. We will frown. <laughs> you shouldn't frown. <laughs> we will frown. <laughs> because okay, it, so, it is work. Mm, it is now, work. Um, we're closing in a bit, but what are those things that people need to do? First steps. Mm. For those who have a default setting of panic, mm. a default setting of stress and what they call stressors, mm. for those who have that quote-unquote negative reaction, emotional reaction and all of that mm. to stress, what are the first steps? Mm -hmm. to, and then what are the subsequent things that need to be done sus sustainably? Okay, sustainably. Okay, first thing, again, is... Um, can I go back to this matter of resolution? I think it's very important that we talk about that before we go into that. The, the idea behind New Year resolutions is that you're talking about what you want rather than what you should have, right? Now, once you get to the point where you're making plans for the year, shy away from resolutions. Resolutions are things that I stopped doing New Year resolutions a long time ago when I realized that it was more like a, like, what do you call it? Something that holds you. A gag. Yeah, you, you know. Yourself. You wouldn't really grow. And then at the end of the year, you're blaming yourself for something you didn't have any business actually resolving to do anyway. So what you need to do, first of all, um, is to have like an introspection going into the year, have an introspection. What do you need? Not what you want. What you want is good. But what do you need? Wants can actually gravitate from your needs. By the time you're meeting your needs, you find that it's easy for you to deal with your wants, right? But your needs should be the very important thing. What do you need at this point? I might want to lose weight, but do I need to lose weight? No. But what I need to do is to be healthy. Now, this is an example, right? What I need to do is to be healthy. Now, because my focus is now about being healthy, what are the steps do I need to take to be healthy, right? But I've understood myself. I now know, okay, what is my medical history? Am I, um, am I obese? Do I have diabetes? Is my own needs the same as Lagbaja's needs, for instance, yeah? So if I see someone doing something, is that something that I should do? So these are the questions you need to ask yourself. By the time you're clear on that, it's easy for you to draw up a plan. And then not just drawing up a plan, you need to have like a review system in place, like a track record of some sorts, where uh, maybe at the end of a month, at the end of two months, you are able to go back and review, okay, how far have I gone? Mm. What have I done in this regard? And it's also important for you to have an accountability partner. I was going to ask if that would help. Accountability, mm. yeah, it's, it's very, very important. Okay. Because it's easy to get derailed. Life happens, as you say, right? So you, we, we are not islands. We need a support system. Mm. And that's what your accountability partner does for you. And we also have to be very careful here with people who run to everybody as accountability partners. There are some people who exude so much negativ neg neg negativity that you don't need in your life, right? You feel that they are your accountability partner, but they're actually bringing you down. What would I be asking my accountability partner? It depends on what your needs are. It depends on what your goals are, right? So you need an accountability partner that keeps you on track. Okay, I'm obese. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's my goal this year, through the year, to lose 10 kg. Mm -hmm. So I, I have an accountability. So am I going to ask her fr from time to time? How am I looking? Uh, am I? No, well, how you're looking, well, that's you to determine you look at yourself in the mirror and you have to love yourself because other people can bring you down yeah, okay. you might look in the mirror and think you look good another mm -hmm. person say ah you don't mm -hmm. so that begins to affect your psyche mm -hmm. so it's not basically about how you look but it's about are you sticking to your plans what plans do you have now your accountability partner is aware of what your goals are and the person actually works with you in drawing up not just vague plans but actually plans that can be um, specific. Yes, very, very specific. Tang exactly. Tangible. So what the person does, maybe every Monday you're supposed to wake up at 6 o'clock and you're waking up at 9. And you're kind of like, Madam, you know, 6 o'clock is the time we're supposed to wake up. So you're having a problem waking up at 6. It's your accountability partner that helps you ensure that you put processes so the in accountability place partner that you wake up at 6. Gives you a cane. Okay. Exactly. Well, there are so many things to ask you. Uh, what the, what 
Yeah. As okay. always, when Chris comes. Uh -huh. Yes, because she's always toggling with her brains. <laughs> Chris Arrow, founder, team lead, the wellness boss. Thank you so much Thank for, you for having your time me. this morning and yeah. um, all the best. Thank always. You. Thank you. Well, we understand there are some people who help to relieve certain kinds of stress or are they also stress mast mastery agents one way or the other that's all when we return with our home stretch okay what a coincidence that after talking about stress and stress relief, <laughs> we have a stress relief here. Machine. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning. Uh, Chidi Uzoma. Yes. Ma. But you know him as Baba Di Baba. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Mr. Aya, good morning. No. Happy New Year Same to you. Same to you. Hey, we'll meet again. We'll meet again. <laughs> I hope Mr. Oluwolabi did it. You know he was here uh, that, for DSS. That sounds ominous. We'll meet again. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like James Bond and the bad guy. <laughs> you know, uh, you know he, uh, he's one of those people of that course, came here. That, uh, yes. I was talking about Mr. Olabi. I hope Mr. Olabi has not come after you. Um, his his uh, children called me. Oh. But I'm not making money with your father's story. <laughs> <laughs> so where's their own share? I was not paid that day. <laughs> I thought that I thought that that fish you are doing. They don't pay me for that show. They won't believe you. <laughs> Baba Di Baba is a comedian, compere, and actor, and he says he's the comedian with the biggest ears and Africa's number one storyteller. <laughs> um. Let me check out those. No, ears. the ears are even reducing now. You know, I'm not adding weight. Mm. Oh, so yes. the ears are looking like they, they match. They, they, the they match now. You know, initially I had slim. I was slim while I had a big, a very big head. So that time that poverty was still showing me Shege. <laughs> but, but now I, you are showing poverty Shege. Uh, God has been faithful. Let me not say what will make kidnappers start looking for me. <laughs> <laughs> because, because those guys are everywhere watching TV. Okay, say don't make them. Uh, wait, let's track him. So I'm, so I'm trying to be careful. Nobody admits that he has made money now. Mm -hmm. Everybody is on low key. You know, even politicians say they share money. They say, you know, we are not sharing money, but you will come. When you come around, we, now money you go collect, but they will not say it. Uh -huh. So I cannot start telling them that I have made it. Well, that's not to say that you have not. Mm. No, all I try to say, <laughs> no, God has been faithful. Mm. Uh -huh. So, and the ministry is going to the permanent site. Mm. Yes. Yeah, even the ministry is moving to the permanent site, and that's a sure sign of. Um, no, I don't want us to attract. Moving upwardly. Yes, by the grace of God. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. So, I don't want to admit anything. Uh -huh. So, they will not call me. But you know, don't want to also deny it. Okay, they said you. <laughs> <laughs> No, your own job is comedy. <laughs> My job is questions. <laughs> well, then you are you're asking me indicting questions. No. The, the DSS is not here. But I was here the other day. Yeah, you, you were guys, here for DSS, yeah, but DSS, DSS was not here. Invited me over the other time. No, DSS arrested you. Arrested? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they arrest four people and invite rich people. Uh, oh, really? Yes. Yeah, they invite rich people. We arrested Alibaba as well, and okay, Bakasi, yes. and Sako. And you invited me. Yes. Yes. Oh, so, so I was not actually arrested. One. You are the rich one. They were the poor ones. So, no, go talk with him, go make <laughs> person. You know, you know uh, this is our industry. We use joke, joke, and enter problem. Now, now somebody will, will watch this show and cut out the other part and say, okay, they are the poor ones, you are the rich, they will not show it to them. Mm -hmm. Then I don't enter a problem. A lot of people have landed you're in not problems going like enter problem. Can you please tell me what a graduate of computer science is doing talking to me about comedy? Okay, I actually did computer science because I couldn't read stories, I couldn't go to the art class, I was finding it difficult to read, even till now I still find it difficult to read. So okay. I was used to mathematics, anything that has to do with touching hands, doing... Yeah, so yeah. why didn't you study mathematics or whatever mathematics? Uh, so I had to go do computer science too. So I had to go to the, do the science and then after everything I dumped my certificates. Although I still studied them, um, I did the website design, journalism also, you know, 
because of the nature of the job, I had to do one or two things that would like journalism and presentation. So I studied those things. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. But that's computer science. I just did it for my father. Ah. You know, our parents want you to do this one, whereas you want something else for yourself. So I had to do it, and after everything, I gave him the certificate. I don't finish. Your, uh -huh. This is it. Did he collect it from you? Ah. He was telling me that hey, he would get me a job. He would talk to one of his friends. I said, I'm not working. I'm not going to sit in anybody's office to do any job. But so I mean, you right? always knew that you wanted to be a comedian? Yes, I had always... No, I didn't know I would be a comedian, but I wanted to be an actor. I just love seeing people on TV. I would always wanted to act. So I tried acting. Acting was the first attempt. I tried it, it didn't work. I paid for so many auditions. What, what do you mean it didn't work? Please tell us about that. Okay, I went for so many auditions. You know those auditions you, be, you, you pay for, you pass the audition. You pay? Yes, you pay for the audition, you pass the audition, and you end up not getting any role. There are times you will be invited for, for casting. And you have passed, you'll be casted, they'll tell you to buy uniform that you're playing student through. Go pay for uniform, finish. That uniform, you know, see, you know, see. So I tried this several times, it didn't work. Now, since the, since the idea was to make people laugh, because I've always made people laugh right from when I was still very young. So I now said, okay, let me try comedy. So I saw Alain Blood then on TV. You know Alain Blood, very old comedian. Mm -hmm. So I saw him on Galaxy TV that day. So my mind just, okay, I will look for this guy. I didn't know how to see him. So when I was looking at Anthony Village, Anthony at Maryland, that Maryland side. I saw his banner, it was his house. So I went to him as, went to him and said, so I want to be a comedian. <laughs> Just like that. He said, I want to be a comedian. He now looked at me. You know, those days, being a comedian, you must be raz. You must look dirty or rough. But being, being a very gentle guy, he looked at me. He said, you're too gentle to be a comedian. I'm not sure you can be a comedian. I said, so I, will be a, I can be a comedian. So he invited me over to the house. In our audition, those days you audition comedians, tell them, make me laugh. And I cracked, you say, ah, you have your own jokes? I said, I've been writing this thing since so. This is our imbo. I was, because I tell stories, basically. So I just told him some stories, true life story. The man laughed and laughed, and he brought me into his TV show. That was how I said that Alain Blue, uh, Alain Blue laughter world comedy show on Galaxy TV there with Alain Blue. And that was how it started for me. Hmm. So. Now, let me ask you, what is it? that has made this industry blossom so much? Uh, I don't know if you follow up. I understand. Yes. Because, I mean, a comedian now is hot, hot in demand. Yeah. Is it that Nigerians are more stressed, that they need people like you to relieve stress for them by making them laugh, or what? Well, Nigerians are stressed, too. Yeah. We are very stressed, and, uh, and a lot of people find it difficult to laugh. That is why they try their best to laugh by inviting comedians. Unlike when you go abroad, once a comedian says something small, everybody is laughing. Nigeria, you go walk, oh. <laughs> because the problem here is too much. And a lot of doctors have told people, this drink where you, this thing where you drink so it did not work. They, they give you medications, so you know, say, go and find a comedian. So we have rich people so who invite you know, comedians and become medication. Yes, now you have taken medication, you're stressed, no, you're still depressed, you're still having issues with the health. So a lot of rich people invite comedians to their houses. A lot their of houses? rich Yes. So what do you do when you get to their houses? You just you play while eating and drinking, you're cracking jokes. I have been paid for it, though. This is new. So you, are, you, you, you go to an in, in-house in restaurant. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Eating and drinking, you're making them laugh, you know. You know. So you may not really come... Is it transferring money to your house? Yes, account? yes. You may not come as a stand-up and start cracking jokes. You're just there to entertain them, or you play with them, you freestyle, you know, you laugh, and you collect your money, the girls. Mm. Yes. With Correct girl. guy. Yeah. But then, at the point, we started having issues with that, because the comedy industry was having issues, but, but they don't want to accept it. And the issues of people stealing people's jokes. So those kind of things were no longer working for some people. Like there is a particular rich man in Nigeria who owns a telecommunication company. He invites comedians to the house. So before you go there now, they will not audition you. The person in charge will audition you. What do you want to talk? Because they've said everything there. Now, like, for instance, I've not been there, but they've said my joke there. So the day I got there, I did not pass. <laughs> they don't crack my joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this thing became a serious issue. At the point, our fans started having issues with us. Like some, some people will be saying that comedians are not cracking, 
saying the same joke, the different comedians are not saying the same jokes. So it became a major problem. And I, I believe we'll work on that. But um, why is that an issue? I ask that because musicians do covers of each other's songs. Okay. Uh, there's this song by, uh, is it Otis Redding? My girl. Oh, it's been done by. Has I been... think only Alero has been done it. <laughs> okay. So that song is very old, maybe yes. like something in the '60s. Yes. Michael Jackson yeah. has done it. Stevie yeah. Wonder has done it. Uh, I think Luther Vandross also. So many people have done the same song. So why can't <laughs> comedians remix? Remix now. <laughs> now let's take it from this. Uh, musicians give credit and they pay reality to the original owners of the songs. You know that. Mm. But comedians don't. A comedian will steal your joke with confidence. When we started comedy, it wasn't like this. Everybody had their jokes. We knew, you knew Basket Mouth is a joke. You knew the social person with his joke. But suddenly, my generation of comedians, because we have different generations of comedians, when my generation came, they started saying people's jokes. A lot of people left comedy because of this. Because comedians have their hit jokes. Mm. Now, when your hit joke is stolen, you are paralyzed. Just like a musician cannot blow without a hit song. Mm -hmm. Now you now have your hit song for you to shine with it. Now a comedian has struggled. That time, to, even to cook up a joke, you try the joke here, it will not work. You go back home, you fix it. The next, nobody still, you become stranded. So a lot of comedians have left the comedy industry because of this thing. I remember you referred to it uh, at our... Um, DSS. D D DSS. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, I don't remember if I'll be right to say that you said that you don't tell other people's jokes. Yes, yes. And That's I did a right. show, yes, to project that. I, I did my show, Comedy Checkup, because we had a lot of issues. The senior colleagues could not fight it. They couldn't fight it because I think they have tried their best. At least uh, monetizing comedy alone is, um, we can applaud them for that. So at least they, are, they have made it a money-making venture. So it is not left for us to regulate it, to do any other thing we can do about it. Because if you don't do it, you will be the one to suffer it. Okay. The guys who are making the money don't have the jokes. Most of them don't own the jokes. And the real owners of the jokes are home, hungry. Now, now quickly, I, I need to ask you this. What is it that happened to our society that made it um, a thing for comedians to thrive. When I was growing up, there were no comedians. Maybe, yeah. I, maybe at best we had Shaky Shaky and Alao yeah. on radio. Yeah. I think that was the closest we had to it. And uh, along the line came um, John Chuku. <laughs> John God. <laughs> and um, this, this guy on radio, Agudai. But they were not stand-ups. Yes, were, uh, they were, they were not stand-ups. So what happened to our society that it transformed yes, it to just... one in which you guys came in mm. and you actually you, you took it to the level Created of an a industry. business. Industry. It yeah. became an industry. I think um, a lot of innovations have come that, that, that we never believed would work. But over time, we bought into it. It's just like the first time I heard about ATM, ATM card. Mm. They say you no longer carry your money, it's not cash, you hold it. I say, ah, you try to go hold ATM. But suddenly the ATM came out and we are all using it. So somebody had carried too much money and the person said, ah, we can still put this in one card and go somewhere and withdraw it. And it's working. So when comedy came, people were enjoying it on radio. At a point, they wanted to see those people on radio on stage. So, and those people then, we are funny on radio, you get. Now people wanted to, to also laugh at their events. So they made, they brought most of them as their MCs, or some were invited as comedians, but they were not actually doing the type of stand-up we were doing. They were more like joke, uh, clowns who just come, do one or two things, and they leave. But a lot of, so some, some set of guys, the ones who, who made it what it is now, decided to start telling stories. And, I said, and now we, we have different style of comedy now. Unlike those days, you just do a joke. Those days, you could just do a fiction, do, say, monkey talk to rats. And people were laughing at those things. And those things didn't make sense to me. But people were laughing at those things. Monkey talk to rats. <laughs> so, so people were laughing at those jokes. Now, a new sort of intelligent, uh, intelligent people came, started doing intelli um, intelligent jokes. 
try doing realistic jokes, then and we have audience for all these things. There are audience that there are kind of stories you will do, they will not laugh. Yeah, so like the elites will not want to laugh at a joke, talk to rats, uh, rats talk to rats now, so yam, yeah, so they're looking at the yam, so they're talking to the yam, yam yeah, the answer that the elites will not want to listen to those, to, to those kind of jokes. Now, those guys have their own clients, they have their audience. You understand? So we have different types. <laughs> So, so I want to thank you people for accepting it. Because if you do not accept comedy, where I go come the, I will now become a celebrity just to the crack joke. <laughs> you come in to come and interview me. Okay. Um, <laughs> now that you were, were talking about this, um, I'd like you to, I've been told many times, yeah, and I know you know, that a lot of work goes into every joke. Yes. I was at Alibaba <clears throat> Spontaneity last year and I had a hard time understanding why the young folks then seemingly yeah. couldn't just get it because most of the questions that were being asked are more or less contemporary current affairs issues. Yeah. Here is a word, crack a joke around it. I mean, that was, you know, the mm. whole idea and was to the same thing you talked about, originality. It's, yes. So tell us about what goes into engineering a joke? Tell us the process that anyone watching, so that people will understand or appreciate mm -hmm. when you say, bring half a million for me to okay. come to your event. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Sometimes um, it depends on individual. You know, there's a way you think. I may see something and it will be funny to me and it's not funny to you. So once I find it funny to me, I'll start working on it. Okay, for instance, um, I did a joke on women don't like Nigerian products anymore. So it, it happened in the market. I went to, a, to the market with my sister, with one of my cousins that visited me. So I wanted to buy this. She would say, now Nigeria own. And she would say, Holland uh, 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 products. They would say, no, USA. Sir. I said, I want, I thought there's one Nigerian product. And I said, when I go to, the, to, to buy pepper, they brought one pepper. They bought Nigerian pepper. She said no. They not showed that. She not asked her, do they do they have Ghana or Cameroon pepper? I said, wait till Nigerian <laughs> product. Wait till... <laughs> yes. Yes, we have Don't Ghana or Cameroon pepper. Yes, there's Cameroon pepper. You know that. No, I know there's Cameroon uh -huh. pepper. So what's, what's the big deal? Pepper is pepper. Uh, yeah, you get yeah, so so that was how that joke came. Somebody else will see it and overlook it. You get so so and after they're working on foreign things, ladies use check their hair. Ladies no longer use their natural hair. You see uh, Brazilian hair, um, uh, Bra Brazilian hair, Indian Cambodian hair. hair, Indian hair. There's one of our bone straight. And ladies love this thing. You ask them why. They say it is real human hair. Mm -hmm. And I say your own hair and animal hair. <laughs> <laughs> This is real human hair. <laughs> but then you will not use this one, you prefer the the Indian hair. Not maybe this. Uh -huh. You don't say because una, una, una don't own. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, nah, you don't fancy. It's, you a, don't, it's a compliment. Yeah, yeah, you don't fancy all these latest things. Because you are not but the new girls. That is why most late most guys are still single. Uh, oh. Right. Uh, to afford the hell this foreign thing is not easy. <laughs> That time to go on a date with a girl. During your days, just go on a date with you. You drink water and you go home. You go on a date with a girl, you must carry woman hair. Before na pizza, no, no, say pizza don't really finish. Uh, pizza shawarma before. Now they tell you, say, eh, my hair. I said, what thing do this one make career? <laughs> <laughs> so, it's crazy. Hmm. Now, these are the, this is the process. Now, you will go on stage and do that. Maybe with the way it happened in the market. You now go on stage and do a joke on it. It may not enter. But you know it is funny. It may not enter. Yeah, you understand? You understand? You understand? <laughs> you understand? <laughs> so you now go home and say, this thing is funny. You, you, you now rewrite it. Okay, let's start, put it from here, put it. You now go to another show, say, it. They, they laugh, laugh, laugh at the point, they don't laugh again. Say, no, that, they, they must laugh. So you go back again. At times you would have been booed. You go and remix it. Yeah, go and remix it. Now you now add, you now lie one lie inside. But that story came from a true life story. You get, you now add something inside and it is bam. Are all your jokes from true life stories? Yeah, I tell stories, my true life stories. 
Mm -hmm. So at times you could just do some imaginary things, but it is inspired by something that uh, happened. By something that in, happened. In, in... There are those who, uh, a friend of mine went and visited Alibaba and saw a library like that of a school. Yeah. And I know that there are a number of people, comedians like that as well, who have huge libraries and they study. Mm. Uh, so is that something also that you want to, you would suggest to anyone who is hoping to become a comedian as well? Okay. Because it's uh, still like, just as you said, my apologies, most young people don't like to read. Yes. Uh, so reading uh, makes, you <clears throat> makes you think faster. For instance, when somebody is spontaneous, most times what we call spontaneity did not just happen. Mm. I need to address that. One way. Yes. It has been in your mind in one way or the other. Because either you have read about something and you not thought about that thing. But, but, but you don't know when to say it or and you didn't when say it, it out. Useful. When it to be useful. But you have it in your head. Yeah. So then you for instance now. I not see one for instance, maybe a lady calls, I, I not talk about that joke. I, I have said I've I've thought about it before. It has yeah. happened before. That then you not say the person is spontaneous. Whereas it had happened, that person had, had experienced such thing, you have read about something like that, you've had it in your subconscious. So it's like you're saying now that anyone who wants to go for spontaneity or anyone who wants to go on such a tangent mm. should be a reader. Someone who yes. does research. Where? There are times. Okay, when I was planning my show, I had to use public transport. Yes, uh, at, at times, as an artist, you may not want to use it because of packaging. Not because you get to uh, you know, the other, you understand? <laughs> but, but that one was intentional. So I, I, I entered the bus from Ikorodu to, to Oshodi, just to and fro like that. And I saw a lot of things. They, they said things inside that bus. One man saw you got home. I said, I, write. I was writing in the bus. Now, at times you need some real life stories. One man sold juju inside moto. You know, people said to someone, go call, sell clothes, go sell medicine. One guy came and he wanted to sell juju. Same trouble. Selling juju inside moto. Okay. And nobody wanted to buy it. Nobody said they know one buy. Because you can be a choir master in your church. Your pastor, they said, I'm both. Now, we must start winding down. Baba de Baba, I see that among your hobbies is going to the market. Yes. Cooking. Yes. And doing house chores. I do house chores. Yeah. Yes, I didn't go out. I was cleaning the house. Uh, and you go to the market? Yes. What, is, what did you enjoy about the market? Haggling? I, 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 I don't know. Okay, I feel... People get cheated when I send them to the market. <laughs> they get cheated or you get Not cheated? you get... Uh, they get cheated themselves, and I mean they suffer, and I mean give them money. <laughs> so I'd rather go to the market and price those things myself. And apart from that, I enjoy it. Because I don't gym, I don't do the kind of... People say they relax, I don't really do those things. You know, how I relax is going to the market. <laughs> oh, really? Yes, yeah, going to the he market. He doesn't go to the gym. He doesn't need the gym. <laughs> but some people go just want to get muscle for nothing. Let me say, no, no one fight anybody. No, and we want a six pack. Uh, who you want? That, what, what, um, somebody told me that I should try and work out that will have muscle. I said, no one want to fight anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Chidi, Uzoma, Baba di Baba. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. And we me. wish you all the best for 2023. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And that wraps up Sunrise for this first Saturday of 2023. Thank you for letting us be a part of your morning. I'm Aleroy Du, wishing you all the best through this week and the year. Well, it's uh, the year is young. Don't forget to go get your PVCs. Amaya Makede, have a wonderful weekend and the rest of your year. <laughs>